Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our work session of Tuesday, June 13th. Can I have a motion to open the work session? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, this should be a pretty quick one. Jill, you want to go through everything? Sure. So we've got administrative items before the board tonight. The first one is the retroactive approval of payment of claims for checks that were dated June 8th. Um, the next was authorization to approve the phase two investigation uh, for Joan Corwin Way. As the board is aware, we are uh, in the midst of um, uh, eminent domain proceedings uh, for the property. Um, the board has been in the habit of requesting uh, to be informed of expenditures that are over $10,000 so that we keep uh, a handle on our spending. Um, this phase two uh, investigation um, is going to be just shy of $15,000. We wanted the board to be aware of it. Um, it is a, an essential step that the, the town takes before it proceeds to uh, further the process of taking the property. Um, we want to make sure that we are aware of what environmental hazards may or may not be on the property. And, well, how and Allie weren't on the board when we started this, right? Ah, so there is a, no, you're just right. Very briefly, just explain. So, real quickly, um, there is property um, on, on Joan Coyne Way, formerly Hunts Place. Mm -hmm. Hunts World Cup. Yeah, I know. That, that literally lies right between our recycling center and Parks Garage and our DPW garage. Um, and it has been for sale. And so uh, the town took the opportunity um, to take it through eminent domain, um, which basically means that the town has, has been able to establish that there is a public purpose uh, for this property, uh, unique to that property, um, and we're in the midst of negotiating the price. But before we do that, we, it's a little abridged. You want to fill in the book? I understand. I understand. That's good. We're, we're in process. We actually haven't started the actual court proceeding. We're negotiating with the property owner. Part of that negotiation is gaining access to the property so we can finish the environmental yes. test. Right. But and this is budgeted very clear. for? Very clear. We do not go in there just eminent the domain. No, 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 no. Try no, no. good way no. negotiate and work it out. Exactly. Yeah. We took the very first step, which was, I think, last year, the board adopted a, a resolution sure. after a public hearing, finding a public purpose, but we actually haven't gone to court to start the formal proceeding yet. Mm -hmm. okay. And we pay for it. It's not like we take it. Away. No, 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 Correct. no, no. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank so, you. Um, and is that part of the budgeted amount? Yes. So, um, the only thing is, is that we, you know, we, we knew that we were going to have to, um, it, we certainly knew we were going to have to conduct some sort of uh, environmental investigation. Uh, our preliminary investigation indicated that we needed to go further. So, mm -hmm. okay. Um, and we'll hopefully, once we, um, they're actually starting tomorrow. The, the 15th, I'm sorry, the 15th, two days. Um, so DPW is uh, asking permission to go in and weed back a little bit and clean the place mm -hmm. out so that they can uh, uh, go in and do some uh, some tests on some soil and just find out the, the extent of whatever um, oil the chemicals yeah. happen to well, be. Well, that's so, very important because yeah. we need to know what liabilities we are uh, absolutely bargaining for as well. Right. So uh, that's Joan Corwin Way. The next one is uh, the park's uh, overhead garage door has finally um, died. Um, and we need to replace it. We're looking at an $11,000 expenditure, uh, $8,500 for the door, and another $2,600 for the electric over there. Um, next, uh, Sabrina has been diligently working um, on some of our uh, grants for this year. We are um, seeking uh, to submit yet another grant submission for the back truck. The back truck is a vacuum truck that goes along and actually uh, cleans out our storm drains all through town. Very important uh, MS4 requirements. We're going to hear all about it later today. Um, but they are um, quite pricey, um, 800 and something thousand dollars. Um, so uh, we're, we're looking for a grant that will help us pay for that. And that's another example of an unfunded mandate and something we just need to spend money on. Mm -hmm. Um, the next is authorization to obtain crane service for the generator removal at the moving water treatment plant. Um, hard to believe, but true. Uh, Twenty thousand dollars was the by far uh, lowest bidder. They went up to sixty thousand dollars to rent a crane so that we could remove the temporary generator and make sure that the concrete pad that's sitting on um, is still intact and that its integrity has not been compromised. Um, Next, uh, we have uh, authorization to award bids for DPW, the purchase and installation of highway maintenance materials. This is the paving contract and things of that nature. 
um, also water maintenance materials, which is every uh, hydrant, every coupling, every screw and bolt, and it is basically the most miserable, painful bid ever, <laughs> ever, ever done. Um, and Christina and Lauren really just did a fabulous Thank job you. with it. Thank you. That's the one that's um, like five. It's really, size it's, one inch screw. Exactly. And two inch oh my. And you have to, <laughs> literally, you have to read inch. every single one of them. Yeah. It's just painful. Um, next is uh, Christine Gray is requesting uh, permission to go to a grant writing workshop so she can uh, do her due diligence on um, pursuing some uh, grants for Rex and Park, which we're thrilled mm -hmm. about. Um, and last but not least, uh, we had spoken uh, last work session about Camp Navi approaching the town um, for a location where they could have a central pickup for their campers. Um, they decided on the back parking lot. Uh, we have an agreement that we had had uh, basically council already prepare. Um, and uh, we're we just need the board's approval, but they're ready to go. They were thrilled with the back parking lot. I think it's going to work out really well there. And we will receive a fee for that. I'm sure you all saw. Yeah, yeah right. Five thousand dollars is what they're paying us. Excellent. Okay, and that's the extent of the um, the administrative items. Anything else? Did we were we going to do another resolution for the um, noise? Yeah, enforcement. I've handed it to. Okay. Do we want to just mention it in in work sure. session? Um, yeah, as a follow up to the SABs. Um, uh, discussion with the town board uh, last week we um, are proposing an amendment to our noise ordinance that would um, allow our building inspector and assistant building inspector to also do enforcement in addition to our police department and we are working on um, an email that uh, supervisor Katz will announce as soon as it's up and running or I don't know if we're gonna give her a preview um, but leaf blowers at mindcastle.org and it will be something leaf that blowers or lower I believe it's singular, but I can ask them to do both, which is what we all we do. Let's do both. Yes. Got it. Do both. Excellent. Okay. Great. Yeah. Great. Okay. Perfect. And that's all I got. Um, I'm also thinking maybe we mention the train station as part of the work session group, just to see if anyone has any issues with it. Oh, uh, the, sure, the, um, the parking. Yeah, so remember, um, I don't know, a month or so ago or longer, I proposed taking some of um, the paid daily parking and making that general three-hour parking and move that to the back lot. So what we thought, what's move here? The paid daily parking the, to the yes. Back lot. So what we thought, what's here in yellow, here, is actually non-resident metered parking. So uh, we thought we would take those spots, which are 33 spots. We're going to move them right when you go over the bridge, right <laughs> along the wall over there, right along the train track. So it, there's actually grass behind it, so you can put up uh, signs that say daily meter parking, non-resident. And then these 33 spots will become regular, you know, three-hour parking spots available to anybody without a permit. Um, I'm still sorry. So, um, Joe, was this in the in the backup documents? No, no, we talked so, about it today. Okay, so I don't, I didn't get one of these. I know, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, just, I didn't only no, I'm showing it no, right I now, but see, oh. um, so it's these yellow spots right here. Um, are they, they are going to go, so it's not on this. Okay. But you know, if you go past Bobo's and you go over the bridge into the back parking lot, if you, you go over the bridge and make an immediate right. It's along the train tracks. Okay. You know, like, we're, we're so gonna, they're we're facing, facing, facing the train tracks. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Not in the aisles. We're gonna get a bigger picture. So, okay. we're gonna get, we'll get so um, I just wanted to kind of let the board know that that's something we're, we think we're going to do. I think it's great because we're going to free up 33 spots. These tend to actually be also the closest ones to kind of the rest of the downtown. Um, and they're right behind, obviously, you know, Pizza Station and Taco Street. So, um, and they're non-resident, and it's not really moving them too much further. And they'll still pay, they still have to get their daily uh, rate, and they still need to pay at the train station. Oh, there's the giant one. It's the giant one. So what we thought, Jill and I walked it today, I didn't want to do, like, the first spots, because I want our residents still to 
be able to do that? It might be been easier if we could all get the photocopy. Mm. Oh, it yeah, said it, 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 photocopy. It's, it's not on it. Not the photocopy only okay. shows this. So what we're talking about is moving these spots right here. The ones that are purple. The purple yeah. ones, which are non-resident spots, starting at like 30. So these will still be for resident parking. So starting around like here, I think it is, right? Or here. And then making the 33 that way. And this way we can put up signs here that say, you know, designate those spots as well. So we don't want to put them within the center because the board has to be able to plow. Yeah. So if we're putting up, um, so we'd move them to back here, Jeremy. Yep. Um, and this way, these are these prime spots are still available for resident, you know, regular sure. parking permit spots. Okay. And then right. it frees up these right here for regular parking. Okay. Well, just to clarify, the non resident ones can be used by residents without a permit absolutely okay yes, yes. But, yes. I do. If, but other, otherwise it's 40 dollars and you annually you get a little card that goes in your windshield and you can park and um, you have to pay right area right pay by day yeah, yeah. And, and for the record you should do that i just got a ticket for 50 dollars parking machine is right at the train station when you go to a permit could you please right. Right. I, can't, <laughs> I can't hear <laughs> Um, I think I think it's a good idea as long as we remain uh, flexible, you know, and we see what changes there are in commuting patterns. Yeah, right. You know, as we go along, and then if we need to switch it back, we can yeah, switch really it back. You can always move things but, um, around. It's just parking. Yep. I think the but I, but I think sense. it's a good idea. I yeah. think it's a good I idea too. for now. Definitely. I do too. So um, we're going to take in uh, order some new signs, mm -hmm. um, and we're hoping that by September we'll give people advance notice that it's going to be shifting. So yeah. we'll put up signs up here that say, you know, coming September 5th or uh, whatever it is after Labor Day, um, that, you know, non-resident parking will be in the south lot and we'll do arrows yeah. so people can follow it. And I will okay. say today is the busiest I saw the back lot. And I think, you know, most people when they're commuting now are commuting like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, yeah. and nobody, not as many people seem to be on vacation now because it's right at the end of the school year. You know, there's a lot happening. And there was plenty of parking. So I'm not super worried about moving those spots over there and freeing up these 33. Thank you. I know that's heavy. <laughs> yeah, I've yet to see the parking lot remotely. As yeah, so um, as so I think it's a great idea. I think it'll free up 33 additional spots, spots for residents <laughs> to park at or non-residents for three hours to go shopping and eating and whatever services getting nails done or whatever they may want to get done in town. So, uh, but I think right. it's important also to note that we can't rely on this, you know, into the future as we're looking at zoning and new developments. We're not I, I don't it. think that, yeah, but I just want to, to caution that this is temporary and we're just testing it out. Well, it's not technically going to be temporary. I mean, if we end up needing to take those spots, we're not, mm -hmm. we're not, doing anything other than moving them and and making these new spots yeah, available obviously. it's not something structural but it it i think it's great because people even now for getting zoning have more places to park yeah i feel like somewhere down hours. it is somewhere down the line we're going to need to cross that bridge we're going to need to look at the whole parking, parking situation yeah anyways. and frankly we're you know we're looking at rfps now for the entire train station area so that may all change right but i think this is for now, I think it's actually a great idea. Definitely. So I'm glad you're all on board. Yes. All right. Um, so we are going to have to, um, it, it will um, draft a local law for us because we are going to have to change the parking sections of the code to indicate where the um, non resident parking can move to. Like the colors on the map are just okay. going to need to be moved. And I guess that's in the legislation. <laughs> okay. Does it have to be like that, or can it just say well, for enforcement. as designated by the? No, for enforcement, it needs to be okay. precise. Got it. Okay. All right. Uh, anything else for the work session? No. I move to adjourn the work session and open the board meeting. I second you. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Welcome now to uh, the public town board meeting of Tuesday, June 13th, 2023. Uh, let's start with any announcements. Bill, any? Or um, 
Just a, a, a reminder to everybody um, that New York State DOT is is scheduled to close Route 120 at Cape Street um, come July 5th. Um, that's, that project is on schedule. Believe it or not, they have moved heaven and earth, and I think they have one last utility to move, but they've actually gotten all the utility work done. So just to remind everybody, um, it's going to be six weeks. Um, 120 will be closed at Kip Street. Local traffic will be able to take a detour up Trip Street to Hard Scrabble and back down to Douglas. Local traffic will be able to access, everyone will be able to access their home, but it's just a matter of how you're going to get there. Oh, Kip, yeah, I'm sorry. Kip, Kip. Kip. Sorry. Trip would be a lot. No, that would be a terribly long one. Yes. Um, and uh, so the. Um, the you, truck. You, well, it close to Holly. Yes, it's, it's closed, closed from, from the bridge, bridge basically, right? From so, the um, at Douglas, unless unless it's local traffic, but people have light. to understand that it's this is not like so a one lane closure. So it'll be closed up to Kip. So it is. Yes. Got it. From the light up to Kip. Yes. Okay. Local local traffic will be able. Everyone can access their homes who live along 120. So we're not you know displacing anybody, but that's where the detour is, and unlike other projects that we've had in town. This is not like a one lane road back and forth. They are literally opening the entire road. It's gonna be six weeks. They have promised they will come in and out. If not, there's all sorts of expensive things they need to do that they don't wanna do. So they're gonna keep it. We've allowed them to work on the weekends. We've allowed them to work extended days, whatever they need to get it done. Um, and they understand that. So by August 18th, they're out of here. Right. So just to let the public know the reason why we're electing to close the road instead of allowing one lane traffic is because it significantly decreased the amount of time it was going to take to get this work done. And we want to get it done given that that's right where the school buses come out. We wanted to get that done um, before the school, you know, after the school year ended and before it started again. So that's why we're trying to compress it into this time period. And while it will be incredibly annoying for residents, you will be very happy when it's over. Um, and it'll be quite less annoying than if it took another couple months. Great. Um, we have uh, consulted with uh, all the first responders. The fire companies are aware. CVAC is aware. The police is aware. Are aware. Um, uh, the bus companies have been notified. The bus companies are able to make that local detour where trucks will be detoured quite a bit around. The buses for camp will be allowed to, to take the local detour, so they really won't be inconvenienced. We've been in touch with all of them. Thank you. Um, How about the residents along that stretch? Have they been notified? Uh, uh, yes, okay. so they, they've been notified as well. The state has been out there. Um, and we're going to make sure we have a police presence on KIPP yes. so to cut down on speeding, you know, right. and just to make sure everyone stays safe. Right. One, one question. Any effect on the uh, Sawmill River Parkway? No. 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 Thank you. Um, th there is a substantial detour for truck traffic, so those signs supposedly went up today. I'm, they're supposed to let us know what they actually say. On the variable sign boards, but we've also asked them for detour signs locally so that our commuting public is aware of what's going on and where the detours are. So don't worry about it. There'll be more information coming, but um, this this project's actually going off, getting off. So it's great. All good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anything else from the town administration <laughs> form? No. No. Okay. Uh, I will save uh, for my supervisor's report, but. The information Jill just discussed, as well as additional information, will be in there, so I urge you all to read it. Um, under Community Corner, I just want to say a happy fourth birthday to Jamie Levine and a happy seventh birthday to Arielle Levine. Yes, they are related. And just wish a hearty congratulations to our Newcastle Gators 8U boys baseball team, uh, comprised of second and third graders from our, our three different elementary schools, and they won the Greater Hudson Valley Baseball Championship. So as a mom and a baseball player, I'm very yes. happy to uh, hear that. So <laughs> congratulations. Um, and that is it. So I think we're gonna move to the presentation of our MS4 report, or can we 
Are we ready for that, or can we move to just public comment new business quickly before we do that? So um, we do have a public hearing tonight on the 50 North Greeley um, net zero carbon legislation. This is not for that right now. This is just regular public comment or new business for anything other than that. So if there's anyone who has that, come on up. Hello, wonderful people. Hello. And those at home. I, I Can just you state your name for the record. Absolutely. My, <laughs> na my name is John Ehrlichy, and um, I do live in Chappaqua. And I am um, the first question I wanted to ask is I had pre previously suggested that we do a uh, more of a comprehensive guide uh, to how to get things done in town, who to ask, who to talk to make it an effect a, a little bit of work both to make it easier for our wonderful folks that serve the community to serve the community by instructing them. Um, I brought it up earlier, we suggested that I consider doing it uh, at uh, the, after January 1 of the new year and now we're getting to July 1 of the new year, but again I want to put it out there because I don't want to forget it. I think there are lots of questions that folks have as to how to get things done, what permit, who do I apply to, what am I going to need. Um, so, John, do you have all those questions written out? Don't have them all. I haven't started writing yet, but that's part that's part of the process, and there will be many edits on it. What I was proposing was a loose leaf binder, so you can just take a page out when there's change, put it in, um, and then. Folks, folks will know. I, I think it'll be unique. I don't think a lot of communities have it because it involves uh, a good deal of uh, follow-up work, and there are changes not only daily. Just like your agenda today, you already had a rather significant uh, addition to to the uh, things that you wanted to cover. Uh, this Who's will be pay a work for in progress. This beautiful binder. Well. Uh, I can pay for the first copy, <laughs> and then as you as we were just John, are you um, saying that every resident, every resident, would get a binder, or is this a no? I haven't made saying, any determination here you, on that, but that certainly right, could be a possibility. This would be a binder that would stay in town. Well, there would be a master binder that would be there, and then we reproduce. But if somebody only had a simple question, you know, in one particular area, <laughs> you know, zoning, for example, you could. Take out the the zoning change page, and update it. And I suspect it will change week to week. That's why I'm I'm seeing it as has to be a loose leaf type type thing. Now, your people will say, "Well, why don't we just put it online?" Well, yes. the problem. I wouldn't say it like yeah. that in those actual <laughs> movements, but I, I would say. I would say, yeah, why in don't fact, I am online? asking. You know, I I understand, but there are some of us that. Uh, I, I was going to make a joke and say some of us that are not virtuous or virtual, uh, but certainly uh, having hard copy in your hand type thing. I know I talked to the people at Apple. I always wanted them to do a, uh, you know, how to use manual, and they said, "Are you kidding?" Um, so John, so I, I think this this could be interesting. I do think it has to go online. Um, I well, I didn't say it, it, it won't, wouldn't be online. Yeah. I think it's it's going to require town staff to put in a lot of work to do this. Why don't we talk about why don't we talk about this offline okay. and figure out what exactly you're you're envisioning? Who would have this master binder? Where is it going to be kept? Who you know? Are we going to who's going to input it online? I know a lot of some people don't use that. I mean, it might be helpful to put. I, I a was binder doing like I this was doing it at center. I, I, you could use you could make JPEGs out of them, or you could make uh, you know PDFs or or whatever that can be filed uh, in the cloud. But I do believe that if you don't, nothing will happen unless you get started. So let's talk about this offline, and I'll talk to Jill, and we'll talk about it in the staff meeting, and let's and and I was actually going to volunteer my time to at least get it started and maybe do a major part of it. Okay. It's just a, you know what the heck. Right. <laughs> All right. Better Thank than losing done. money on publication. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to uh, to bring up today is I made it a point to to drive the the boundaries and the roots of the maps that we all saw last last week. 
uh, the, uh, the, the renderings. And I, I imagine myself passing Rite Aid and what it would look like uh, with, the, with the new things there. And Is this a Rite Aid public comment? Because I'm going to have you save it until the public hearing. No, it's not that. I'm just saying I, I went past it and everything seemed fine. That's all. Have a nice day and thank you for your time and your effort. And I'm here to help. And don't forget the Chapel Co op Performing Arts Center. It's a good place. Thank you. Thank yes, you. it is. <laughs> uh, all right. Any other uh, public comment or new business? Okay. All right. Well, then we are going to move to the exciting world of MS4 and our requirements. It's going to be really excited. Oh. Good evening, everyone. Oh, wait a minute. Good evening, everyone. Um, every year we are required to report on our municipal separate storm sewer system progress in accordance with the New York State DEC stormwater regulations. As an MS4, we have um, six minimum control measures that we need to meet, and one of the requirements is to present our annual activities at a public hearing before your board, before we submit our annual report. So tonight, myself and the town engineer, Bob Scioli, are here to share with you our annual report. So. To start off, what is stormwater? And it's just what it sounds like. It's water that when it rains, water flows over the earth and it goes to its near, nearest outlet, which is usually a stream, a river, a pond. As it is traveling, it will pick up all sorts of pollutants. If it goes over a parking lot, it may pick up oils and other metallics that are in the pavement. If it goes over a sidewalk, it may pick up sand and dirt and debris from that sidewalk. This is all the storm water is the water that is carrying these pollutants to our water bodies. When we think about Newcastle and we think about water, there are four different watershed basins in Newcastle. And I'm sure all of you pretty much know the big one. That's the New York City watershed known as the Croton River Basin. We also have land area within the Lower Hudson River Basin, um, finally known as the Pacantico or the Sawmill River. We have land area within the Bronx River watershed, which drains to the Kensico Reservoir, also part of New York City's water system. And we also have a small area of the community in the upper Long Island Sound watershed. And what that means is that water that falls within those drainage basins drains to those major water bodies. Okay, so you may think you have a little stream running behind your property. That stream is connected to a much larger water body depending on the topography that exists between where that stream is and where the major outlet is. And the major outlet, those are the, the big lakes, reservoirs, the river, those are the big outlets. Here's a map of the hydrology. You can see the dark blue lines are really the major basins and all of the little blue lines are all these little streams and rivers throughout the community. So we have a lot of them. And New York State DEC regulates everything that goes into them from our properties, from our roadways, and from our public places. When we think about water quality, different drainage basins have different thresholds of pollutants. The Croton Basin is known as being phosphorus limited and phosphorus uh, accelerates algae growth. So that reservoir has a standard that is set by New York State DEC as a limit as to what it can accept. The Long Island Sound watershed is a little bit different in that it is nitrogen limited. So different water bodies, different watersheds have different levels of contaminants that are separately regulated by the Department of Environmental Conservation. We also have water bodies in the community that are listed on the state priority water bodies list. And these are, are different water bodies that because of suspected pollutants, pathogens, metals, nutrients, are seen as problematic and not living up to their intended use. 
Water bodies are also listed on what's known as the New York State DEC 303D list, and that really is affiliated with the Sawmill River and the Bronx River watershed. And these different lists um, are compiled by New York State DEC. Sometimes the uh, information is submitted to DEC by a citizens action group, by a not-for-profit group, by a town or an individual and the DEC will do investigation and determine whether or not there is a compromise to water quality in these water bodies. But they will list them, and this listing helps give the town guidance in identifying different actions that should be taken in different areas of the town to improve water quality. When we start talking about our MS4 permit, Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. If we start looking at how we control water quality, we have something called the State Pollution Discharge Elimination System, or a SPEEDIES permit, for discharges from Municipal Separate Storm Sewer Systems. So this is the fancy title that relates to our MS4 permit, our Annual Stormwater Permit. So just for familiarity's purposes, this is the actual number listing GP-0-15-003 with changes over time. This permit has been in existence since 2016. We are now in 2022. It has been expired since 2020. The state is still revising the MS4 permit. There's been instances where the revisions were promulgated and comments, public comments were accepted. The state has gone back to rewrite the permit and we have yet to see a new version. We are anticipating a, a new version of the MS4 permit within the next couple of years. And typically when the next version of the permit is issued, it means more stringent requirements than what we do today. When we talk about the phase two stormwater program, I mentioned earlier that it is six minimum control measures. Minimum control measure number one is public outreach. Minimum measure number two is public participation and involvement. Minimum measure number three deals with illicit discharge detection and elimination. We have construction site runoff control, post-construction site runoff after something is built, and we have pollution prevention and good housekeeping. And pollution prevention and good housekeeping really relates to municipal operations and how we manage our sites in relation to protecting water quality. When we talk about public outreach and education, we are really looking at the, the several different audiences that we tend to educate about water quality every day. They range from public employees to residential residences, residential property owners, our businesses, contractors who work in the town, developers who work and live in the town, our general public, landscape contractors, and our board and committee members. And so the things that we talk with them about, construction site management, um, green infrastructure, recycling, pet waste management, all of those actions, the myriad of detail that we converse with all of these entities on a daily basis, all relates to the protection of water quality. There's what's known as best management practices, we educate people on how to undertake best management practices or conduct their activities so that they're not impinging water quality. And that's all about public education and outreach. It's informing the public. We, we aside from the day-to-day -day contact, we do a mailing every year. If you've all received the water quality report this year, you'll see information regarding water quality, stormwater management, washing your car, um, mowing your lawn. All of the practices listed in that mailing relate to our MS4 permit. We have a mailing list where we email information to people on a regular basis. We hold public, public events and presentations where we talk about water quality. We even do cable access information regarding stormwater and water quality. We have printed materials 
and we conduct daily inspections where our inspectors are out on properties on a daily basis talking with contractors and property owners regarding best management practices to protect water quality. We also have materials that you can pick up in town hall, at the library, um, in the public works department that will help you understand what it means to protect water quality through your everyday actions. Now, under our stormwater um, report, we are required to evaluate our progress in meeting our minimum control measures. And we can see that we're making a difference in educating people about water quality due to the amount of information that people pick up from our offices, the website clicks that we see, the number of applications that come into my office that contain low impact development techniques. So we know that the word is getting out there regarding the protection of water quality and the control of stormwater pollutants. The second minimum control measure that we need to be reporting on is public participation and involvement. This gets to our cleanup events that we hold. We have a community hotline where people can call and talk to us about water quality problems they might have or something that they might see. We've conducted community plantings to help improve um, stormwater quality. We have community meetings like this one where the public comes and they listen and they <laughs> listen to development applications and the green infrastructure that's being implemented. And we post this annual report on our website and this presentation will be seen on the cable access channel. Again, how do we evaluate this minimum control measure? People discuss stormwater related issues at public meetings, during public comment, public hearings. We have the townwide mailing and we have a questionnaire on our website that we ask people to fill out and we get hits once in a while when somebody actually does. Mm -hmm. This next minimum control measure, I'm gonna turn it over to Bob to kind of give you a definition of illicit discharge uh, detection and elimination and he can start with that definition and then I'll go through um, the first part of that action and he'll go through the second. Bob, do you want to start? Thank you so much, Ms. Sabrina. Good evening, town supervisor and members of the town board. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, basically, the illicit discharge definition, so everyone's on the same page, is defined as a discharge that is not entirely stormwater. And as Sabrina mentioned earlier, Stormwater is basically composed of rainwater, surface runoff, and snow melt, uh, which drains into the town closed drainage system, which is known as the MS4, which is known as also the Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. Um, next slide, please, Sabrina. Or you want to go anything on this slide? Well, I think, Bob, we had talked about really looking at illicit discharge and detection in two parts. There's the physical mapping of the system that falls under illicit discharge detection and elimination. So there's a mapping and an investigation side. And then there's the actual identification of something and the follow through cleaning it up. So just for the for the board's information, we utilize our geographic information systems to collect and inspect our outfall system. So all of our outfall systems are, are on a computer map. We have handheld devices that our field guys go out and collect information on, and we sync it up to our GIS system. We, in town, we have 234, 239 outfalls this past year were inspected or, or known as dry weathered screened. So to see if there was contaminants in them, water running in them when it shouldn't have been, and that that is the work that's being done in the field during the year, during the day. Building maintenance, commercial car washes, parking lots, cross connections, outdoor fluid storage, vehicle maintenance repair shops, septic maintenance are typically targeted for inspection, right? So if we know we have a gas station, we're going to go to that gas station, the outfall by that gas station, and see if there's any flow that shouldn't be there. Um, so it's very much an investigative or a, um, an inspection element. I'm gonna, Bob's gonna talk about the next, um, I'm gonna talk about this slide, then Bob's gonna go into um, the actual uh, discharge detection and elimination standpoint. 
So one of the things that is required by New York State DEC under illicit discharge detection and elimination is to map your storm sewer shed. We were one of the first municipalities to map all of our storm sewer shed components, our pipes, our outfalls, and our inlets. As I said, the information is in our geographic information system and 75% of relevant staff that are responsible for IDDE inspection, detection and elimination have been trained throughout this last year. Go ahead, Bob. Thank you, Ms. Sabrina. <clears throat> uh, basically this reporting period, we did not have any illicit discharges. Uh, basically, in this town, we're fortunate that there's not much in this regard commercial development because the majority of the illicit discharges and illegal connections come from predominantly commercial properties. Um, the only types of illicit discharges we have in this town over the past several years were those of the types where you have a failing septic system, which sometimes flows into the town road and then eminent and then discharges into the town system where we work with the Westchester County Department of Health as well, uh, in which they give them a notice of violation or we give them a notice of violation as well. And then they do uh, correct it by either fixing or remediating the existing septic system. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next minimum control measure is the construction runoff site con control. Basically, this is designed to basically reduce as much as possible, the amount of erosion and sediment that comes off a site during construction. Uh, there's a general permit for stormwater construction activities manual, which we use, which is predicated upon the GP020001, as Sabrina mentioned before. <clears throat> and it has a whole litany of items that must be followed, basically with the design, with the construction, with the inspection, and what the owners are required to do during that time of construction, because most of the time, all of the sediment that comes off and reaches any type of water body, uh, picks up the sediment and goes into the water bodies and creates all the pollution that obviously they try to avoid, which creates the water quality problems. But again, this is only geared towards construction activities. Next slide, please. Uh, the strategies that we use are the SWIP inspection review procedures that are in place as per DEC, uh, as the GP020001, which is basically a manual, which we use as a guideline for that. Uh, during this review period, we had eight SWIPs reviewed. That's just the SWIPs that are uh, basically reach the thresholds that the DEC requires. There's many, many other stormwater reviews that we have in town for the building department and building permits. However, they don't exceed the thresholds required for these, which is anything that disturbs more than 5,000 square feet in the east of Hudson watershed. Um, our town code is much more stringent than actually the DEC. We require post stormwater construction for anything that is at, that increases the stormwater impervious by 1,000 square feet. And then the last bullet item is procedure to receive public comments is in place. We get uh, public comments on that all the time. Any type of complaints we get, we go out there to take a look at the sites that are under construction as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, some examples of what the uh, basically minimum, oh, the, I'm sorry. This is the next minimum control measure five. This is the post-construction runoff control. Post-construction runoff control is uh, basically everything that needs to be done, which precludes any type of runoff after construction. In other words, there's a New York State designed stormwater manual, which we use as guidance to design any type of stormwater system that needs post-stormwater management construction. Basically any type of retention basin, any type of sand filter, any type of infiltrators, uh, any type of low impact development, green infrastructure, it's all in the book. And this is very critical, uh, not only during construction, but what you need for construction, because this mitigates, attenuates, and reduces the water quality to the standards that uh, the DEC requires, and also reduces the flooding that creates many problems in town as well. So that's what minimum control measure is all about 
post-construction runoff control. Uh, next slide, please. This is an example of one of two of the basins that they that was constructed uh, during the Brandywine construction, which is off of Brandywine Drive. Uh, the photograph on your left is basically the northern basin, which basically picks up everything from the north part of the subdivision, uh, heading south towards this basin. Um, that's just north of Cynthia Court. The photograph on the right represents the basin, which is composed of several smaller basins, which pretty much treats uh, four <coughs> lots south of Cynthia Court, and it treats everything, it mitigates it, it attenuates the peak flows release, which is in cubic feet per second, and also attenuates the volume of runoff um, and water quality before it gets into the downstream areas. Next slide, please. Um, Basically, these are the strategies that are implemented during a uh, minimum control measure. Uh, we had three active construction projects disturbing one or more acre in town. One of them is Toll Brothers, of course, the East Village. Uh, the other one is a project being done by the East Hudson Watershed on Cortonell Road. And another one was a uh, residential property. All of these sites are routinely inspected by the engineering division, which is required by DEC. Um, Terry Road goes out and inspect those all the time. In addition, um, on the bigger sites, commercial sites and major subdivisions, um, the applicant's engineer has to perform inspections as well. So it's like a redundant system where they do the inspections, keep their own reports, we review the inspection reports, and also we go out and, and keep track of what they do. So it's a, it's a good system. And it makes certain that everyone's on the same page during the constructions, especially of the major construction sites, commercial properties, and major subdivisions. And other uh, post-construction one of control, which is big on, again, the major subdivisions and the commercial properties, is that the owner is obligated to submit legal documents, which are ran by council, uh, which we all review as far as the maintenance of this type of post-stormwater construction uh, items they may have. It can be a sand filter, it can be infiltration system, it can be a water quality basin, it can be a, a wetlands basin. So all those are worked into these agreements, which is called the stormwater uh, maintenance agreement and easement agreement, which gives the town a, the right to go over these properties at any time if there's any type of complaints on them, if they're not being maintained property uh, in perpetuity, by the way, they all are. So all the agreements have to be looked at by town council and approved by the town board. And not only that, they're recorded in the Westchester County Clerk's Office. So everyone can find them readily available and they get picked up during a closing. So it goes from one owner to another to another. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are evaluating measures and the progress. All construction projects that are required are, have to submit the SWIPs. Uh, we make certain of that in our department and the stormwater practices and associated best minute practice continue to be a focus regarding project review and approval. And they are all implemented any project that goes before the planning board, the zoning board, uh, even at the building permit SWIPs as well. Next slide, please. Um, Post-construction runoff control five obviously is a big item. Um, the strategies implemented, there were five post-construction stormwater management practices. These are basically ones that were built um, by projects in town that are maintained by the town. Uh, DPW, few of them, one being a sand filter, which is located in the south parking lot and the grass median, which picks up a lot of the runoff, portion runoff from the actual pavement, treats it, and then releases it into the stream, which is the headwaters of the sawmill. Another post stormwater management practice is a hydrodynamic separator. Uh, which basically filters out any type of sediment and debris in that to a certain storm event. And that is another one located in the actual Woodburn parking lot, which is located behind Bank of America. And then another one is located that was just put in for the Chappaqua Hamlet Improvement Project, which is located behind Dunkin' Donuts, uh, which is also a hydrodynamic separators too. In addition to that, there were 275 catch basins inspected, 275 clean, which is all performed by DPW, Fort Carry. Uh, and then we keep, they keep Excel spreadsheets, utilize the track post construction BMPs as well. 
And on top of that, we have local law, which is chapter 108A, 108B. 108A is basically with the stormwater management and erosion and sedimentation control. And 108B, as we touched on previously, has to do with the illicit discharge. Then we have overlay districts, which, which are the environmental overlay districts, comprehensive <laughs> planning, zoning and planning board review procedures and the building codes have been used to implement low impact development, better site design, reduce flooding. That's why main concern reduce flooding, improve water quality is a big thing too. DEP, DEC are big on water quality, obviously for obvious reasons. They don't want any type of water to degrade the quality of the reservoirs, which are for New York City as well. Next slide, please. And basically the strategies implemented. I'm gonna turn this over to Ms. Sabrina because she is actually a member of the East of Hudson Watershed Corporation and she knows a little bit about Seaquick and she can explain what she's involved with with that. And I'll turn it over to Ms. Sabrina. Thank you, Bob. So one of the minimum control measures involves post-construction stormwater management. And as Bob has been talking to you, he's talked about what happens after a construction is complete and you're left with what is on the site. Well, New York State DEC has created through the MS4 program a retrofit program where you can undertake projects for phosphorus credit within the New York City watershed. It's very difficult in a town such as ours that is primarily a residential community, but we have discovered a couple of sites where we can acquire some phosphorus credit. DEC has assigned every municipality within the New York City watershed a, a threshold number of phosphorus that we need to reduce every year within the permit time frame. Right now, all, at the beginning, when this first came out, all of the watershed municipalities <laughs> said, we all cannot do this because many of the municipalities are like Newcastle, primarily residential. There's a big cost differential between doing work in Newcastle and doing work in Putnam or Dutchess County. So we got together and formed an entity called the East of Hudson Watershed Committee, who formed the East of Hudson Watershed Corporation. The East of Hudson Watershed Corporation is a separate entity that conducts um, phosphorus, that implements water, uh, phosphorus reduction projects, stormwater control projects, under what is considered umbrella compliance. If a project is implemented in Putnam County, the town of Newcastle will benefit from that project and help us meet our goal of 50 kilograms per year or 25.7 kilograms per year because we are tied together through the corporation. And so we have been we have been working through the past 10 plus years with our partners in the East of Hudson Corporation to meet our phosphorus reduction target that is regulated by DEC. So we have we are a member Right now, that corporation has completed 159 phosphorus reduction projects. 35 projects were completed during this year. We have five projects that we have submitted for phosphorus credit through the corporation. We have a project in Burden Preserve. We have a project on Shether Road. We were able to obtain credit through Chapical Crossing, and we have a project on Courtmel Road. And we've had our very first project go into construction this year. We are in the midst of finishing that project. We likely won't finish planting that project until the fall, but we will be able to obtain credit under the program for doing that project. So it's very exciting to have a project in our town. Do you want me to do this, Bob, or do you want to do this one? Go right ahead, Sabrina. You're on a roll. Okay. <laughs> so our last minimum control measure is minimum control measure six, and this is really stormwater management for municipal operations. So our town conducts a lot of activities that could impact water quality. We maintain our streets. 
We have bridges that we cross. We have winter road maintenance activities, salt storage activities, our solid waste management, um, municipal construction that we undertake, land disturbances that we undertake. Um, we do a hydrologic habitat modification, our tree plantings and our stream bank projects. We maintain right-of-ways. We have our parks and our open spaces where we maintain grass and leaf blowing. We have municipal buildings. This building counts towards our, post our, our stormwater management for municipal operations. We maintain our own vehicles at our DPW yard, and we have fleet maintenance. We have so many activities that occur on all of our municipal properties that we need to conduct or perform in a manner that protects water quality. So when we look at what we have done this year in relation to municipal operations, we have swept 52 acres of parking lots, two times. We have swept 225 miles of streets, one and a half times. We've inspected more than 275 and cleaned more than 275 catch basins this year. We have inspected and cleaned the five post-construction control practices that Bob spoke of. And we've applied 2,100 pounds of nitrogen in fertilizer to our properties. And again, 75% of municipal employees who need training received it. So this all counts under our municipal operations. Evaluating this measure, minimum control measure, relates to reporting procedures for all the municipal departments that contribute to putting this report together. We have good, good housekeeping responsibilities that they're undertaking and maintenance activities that they conduct, which we count for in this annual report. We, work to ret we are working to retrofit the record keeping. We are moving from an era where everything was done on a notebook with pen or sometimes pencil. We're moving to handheld devices and cataloging in, in different forms of, of um, spreadsheets on the computer. So we're really trying to update what we do in the field via the phone and have it directly upload to the cloud and download to our database. So this is a huge transition <laughs> for some of our workforce and it's being done seamlessly due to technology. And we're looking at verifying our infrastructure. You know, what is the size of our pipes? How many pipes do we have? Are they inspected and cleaned? What is the material they're made of? What size are they? So all of this information we're starting to build into our databases. So moving forward, we'll have a seamless system where we can say it was inspected, what date it was inspected, and oh my goodness, it broke. How are we fixing it? Who's fixing it? What's the material? All the guesswork that we used to have to guess um, will be right there on the screen for us. Strategies. So we have an education program in place to address phosphorus and nitrogen. 100% of our conveyance system has been mapped and we have additional features as I was just explaining. We do inspection and maintenance. We have a plan and a program put in place to make sure that we inspect and we maintain the entire system over time. We have a program to track on-site <coughs> wastewater treatment systems, failures of those systems. We work with Westchester County to catalog those systems that have been repaired or replaced. We have our post-construction program in place, as Bob explained in detail. And we're in the second five-year permit cycle, also known as six to ten years. And we're continually looking for projects in our community that are cost-effective. Mm -hmm. So for more information on this program, you can contact the development department or visit mynewcastle.org. Thank you, Sabrina. You're welcome. Thank you, Sabrina. Right. That was amazing. Uh, anyone have any questions? Um, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much to everyone in the town. This is an amazing enterprise. With this alone, um, from the educational, you know, of course, the stormwater management, the education, the reporting, the equipment that's needed, and I guess we'll talk about that, is amazing. Um, what kind of help do we get from the state? To, to, I mean, obviously, this benefits 
so many regions and it, it benefits the entire state. So we really don't um, do we get any kind of the, the the most help we get from the state honestly is the ability to apply for funding to, and i know the answer i know it's yeah. nothing i just want everybody to know we that's don't. why I'm we, we do not um i think that for the state it was a really big win for all of the new york city watershed municipalities <coughs> to have the state accept umbrella compliance one of the <clears throat> more detailed uh retrofit projects stream bank stabilization was counted for phosphorus reduction we had to work real hard with the state who was willing to accept that as a qualified project for phosphorus reduction had they not accepted that project we would not have the projects that we have in town because there is a lot of phosphorus running off of a stream bank that we can now capture and control and we get a lot of credit for that so so that is something so from a from a policy standpoint the state is helpful from a monetary standpoint they are not right we're quite lucky to have that consortium yes to, to, to be a part of um I, I think that's all i have i, I now. have one question for you so last year we the state proposed to mandate significant new requirements Correct. that would have cost millions of dollars um, and we were successful along with other municipalities to be able to lobby to stop that um, at least for now. for now so have you heard uh, any updates about anything that may be coming kind of downstream not yet um, we've been quiet since that okay that's good yeah but but you're 100 percent right the the new right the draft permit that came out included an extensive amount of changes that would cost unbelievable amounts of money for each of the municipalities due to the level of detail that they were regulating that again were unfunded and unfunded unfunded so we were very successful and as a community working with other communities doing the same thing trying to quantify that expense and um, submitting comments to DEC who have yet to revise probably a revised permit because of that because of that. And so the environmental community very much wants monitoring at each of our retrofits, at each of our sites, um, which requires a whole new workforce right, to undertake. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the big areas that we push back on. Sorry. So the grant yeah. application, the letter that the board's going to approve later in the, um, in the meeting, is the letter of support in, um, in conjunction with the back truck uh, grant that Sabrina is once again applying for. We're hoping this year we get it. We get it. Um, we came close last year, but didn't quite make it. So we're hoping that uh, our application we we plugged all the holes in our application, and it's much stronger this year. But again, that's an eight hundred and something thousand dollar piece of equipment that is required for us to be able to comply with the MS four requirements. Um, and so, just the equipment alone is you know more than three quarters of a million dollars and then the staff and everything else but, but just to put it in perspective um we have a vac truck right now it is a single operation truck it just collects the sediment oftentimes the department of public works needs additional equipment brought to a site and for every piece of equipment at a site it is at least a minimum of three employees who need to be at that site we do not have the size of workforce to do what they want us to do to clean the number of catch basins. We're doing the best we can. We're on a five year plan to kind of get through all of our catch basins, right? That is very weather dependent. It's seasonally dependent. And we are required by the state to finish it yearly, if not twice a year, but we are handicapped by the equipment that we have. And so it's imperative that we receive funding to improve our equipment to multi-use tools for lack of a better word, <laughs> to make this job easier, involve less people at a site at any one time, and can handle the type of infrastructure that we have. And you know, I just wanted to be clear that I think this is really important work. 
you know, I think it needs to be done and, and water quality is, is really crucial. And so I think this needs to be done. I just think it's unfortunate that the state is just leaving municipalities to do it on their own. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. a big undertaking. Big. I mean, it was their requirements that we successfully fought against were going to cost us upwards of like an additional six million dollars. It was a it was a lot of money. It was countless. Yeah. Uh, are there opportunities to get efficiencies by partnering with other municipalities or the county level or anything like that? Well, so it's about, well, yeah. well, and and so the problem <laughs> with that is that when we need, like for example, sharing a backdrop. When we need the back truck, they need the back truck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, where we have efficiencies like joining the East of Hudson Watershed Coalition, the, the corporation, that is an efficiency, mm -hmm. right? Where we can, where we do education materials, Westchester County produced a lot of the early education materials that we use today to get out to our community. So where we can coordinate on efficiencies, we do. All right. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Appreciate thanks it. To Bob. And thanks, thank you, Bob. Bob. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Good night. Have a good night. Good night, all. All right. So now uh, we are going to uh, turn to our public hearing uh, that's been previously adjourned on the uh, North Greeley Net Zero Carbon Legislation. Um, you missed public comment started early. We did. Okay, you can come on up. If you have additional public comment, come on up. We did. We swapped them. <laughs> you gotta be here on time. <laughs> Go ahead. <clears throat> Just state your name for the record, Bob. Bob Fleischer, uh, Oak Hill Road in, in Newcastle. Um, I wanted to speak to you. I'm not sure if you spoke about it in the supervisor's report or if you, or if you bypassed that. Uh, also, in those four minutes, so I think it was supervisor's report. Um, there was a bill passed this, uh, I guess it was Saturday morning, around 1 15 in the morning, um, by the state senate. The state assembly had already passed it that consolidates all town elections throughout the state of New York into even years, which basically means that right now we have a system where each of you run, and let any of you who have run, have run either in 13, 15, 17, 19, 21, and this should be 23. Um, they'd like to change that so that moving forward, all those elections happen only if there's a presidential election or a governor's election. So last year, Excuse me? And congressional. And congressional. Uh, well, well, they currently still, still run. So last year, uh, when we had a special election, you can get a feel for it. Um, the town board, one town board seat was in the 16th column. That's where you, where you and Chris were, in the 16th column. And, you know, that would, that would push our town board elections. Um, either to the 16th column or, or, or farther out. Page two. Right, in some cases, they had a second page. I'm not sure how small the print's gonna get. Um, this seems to be, be being done under the guise of the idea that it's higher turnout. And I get the fact that certain elections have, have low turnout. The biggest portion of our tax bill that we get here, everybody here in this room has the lowest turnout. Um, of any election in town, which is the school board election. I think if we get 10%, I'm not even sure we, 10 or 11% is probably par for the course. No one's too concerned about that. So they're trying to, and if Hochul passes, if Hochul signs this legislation, all the, our, the, our election infrastructure and how we've, um, I guess, for as long back as I've been here, and certainly much farther back, uh, is going to change. Three of the four of you, the people all sitting in the middle, you would not be sitting up here. I am quite confident that you would not be elected, you would not be appointed, and you would not be elected. To me, that's concerning. Um, you'd be sitting here, 
I'm not sure what gender you'd be saying. Um, that to me is not what is respectful of the importance of issues, of local issues, and even, even regional and county issues. Not every, every election needs to be nationalized or built around issues around Albany. To me that, you know, the, I think of all the activists who focus on really important issues that, that are local or maybe county-wide, that getting your voice heard in presidential election year on even an issue like the airport, that would not have happened. On an issue like development, that would not have happened. On an issue like the FBC, that would not have happened. All these things, I can't tell you how things would have snowballed, but the world as we know it in our town would be different. And I really want to hear what you as a town board feel, because time's of the essence. This is going to be signed, could be, could be signed tonight, could be too late. So I think it's important for the community to understand, and I'm sorry to be just dumping this on you, but this is how it was dumped on all us. There was no public outreach. There was no, you know, notice. When, I'm, I'm not sure if any of you found out earlier, but you found out midweek, end of the week. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is not, to me, good governance uh, for something this large. This isn't like, you know, adding an extra $20 million for a special bill or a special project. This is changing the nature of how, it, how mo so many towns vote, including ours, throughout the state. So, Rob, um, I'm just going to interrupt you a little bit. Uh, so we did find out about this late. Uh, I know we did not hear about this from our assemblyman or our, uh, our state senator. Um, I did reach out to them when I heard about it um, and expressed some of my concerns. And uh, Assemblyman Burdick said, having been a town supervisor, that while he was initially in favor of it because it would increase voter turnout, he realized for all the reasons that you just articulated that it was it was not a good idea for local municipalities because it really puts um, it puts local elections really in the hands of national politics and um, anything that's being looked at on a national level as we saw with the last election is going to fold itself into local election which it really shouldn't there needs to be a focus on that there was also no town supervisor or town in general that I am aware of that asked anyone to float this legislation. In fact, the person who sponsored it uh, represents a village which is not impacted by this legislation at all. I know that every, uh, every town supervisor that I have spoken to is completely against this. There's actually a petition that was just circulated uh, right before this meeting um, that I'm going to send to the board. Uh, asking Governor Hopo to please veto this legislation. Um, some on this board may feel differently, but I happen to agree with you that I think this is terrible governance. I think it's bad for democracy. I think it's bad for local municipalities um, because I think there are issues that need to be focused on and that constituents and residents and voters need to focus on in their local municipalities that have nothing to do with national politics. Um, as we saw in the last election. And um, I, I think that this is going to really provide um, a, a big hindrance to that and to, to local elections. And I, the fear is that anyone who does want to run on something other than potentially a national party uh, that doesn't agree with the majority of the town in terms of national politics is, is no longer going to be able to do that. Okay. For the last five elections, that's, that, that's been the case for the person who won the town supervisor's role in this town, up in Mount Kisco. The, mm -hmm. the heart of their board came from an independent ticket. I don't know as well, you know, the history of, uh, of other towns around us. And, you know, and, and uh, Assemblyman Burdick did say, you know, he heard from a bipartisan group mm -hmm. of town supervisors who did not want this. They did not. Um, uh, county legislator did vote in favor. County legislator Gashi said also he was not in favor of this mm -hmm. 
because he's been, he didn't go through all his reasons, but he said he wasn't aware of it and he, and he wasn't in favor of it. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to know, you know, I think the community deserves to know not just what your perspective, but from all of your perspectives. I know, it's, like I, said, I know it's getting dumped on you, but it got dumped on all of us and where we are to move forward and to say something because they're not giving us any time to react. Maybe, you know, they tried the, the, the housing compact and they gave us time, people time to think about that. And that didn't work out so much. <laughs> um, but here, no time. This is passed on. We, I think on Saturday uh, I morning, became aware of it the, the day that it was being voted on. So, you know, I would appreciate not sure if anybody right. can, can comment, but. Uh, I'll comment. We actually, as a board, haven't had an opportunity to even talk about this together. Um, I was made aware of it over the weekend and had some time to just briefly think about it. And um, I agree with a lot of the points that you stated, Lisa stated, and and uh, Chris Burdick and, and Badat. I, I am concerned that local politics are starting to matter less and less and we're kind of being forced into one direction or the other and we're missing an opportunity for communities to decide for themselves what our solution should be to problems that maybe other places don't have or do have or um so without having had the opportunity to talk to everyone on the dais tonight my my feelings are very much in line with what lisa just just said we haven't had a chance to talk about it but my my sentiments echo hers anybody else Anyone else want to comment on that? I'm happy to say, actually, I actually agree with you, Rob. Um, but I, I would also tell you that you should not worry. I'll always represent you. Excuse me. I'll always represent you. You said you weren't sure if I'd be up here. But I'll, no, no, I'll, no, I'll I said, we be sitting. You definitely would be up here. No, I, I'll, I'll continue to represent you, but I have an agreement with you in, in the principle. I think it's, a, it's the right principle. It's, it's... Um, I would say that local politics are very important. And whatever encourages that, is something that I'd be in favor of. Um, but just because I like to look at two sides of everything, I would say that it's not necessarily the case that because people are voting for a national candidate, that they're forced to vote a certain way for the I, local candidates. And every election is different. I don't and so think, it is yeah. important for every candidate to state their case, to go to their community, make their arguments, get on the ballot and do their best. I know that the tide can be against people at times if, if it's an issue that's hard to communicate about. But, you know, just you're, you're making a lot of assumptions. You know, you're assuming that people will necessarily vote a certain way all the way down a line. And that has not always been the case. Well, that, that, that's the so, motto of, 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 of one of the right. parties. <laughs> so, you know, I think that, exactly. And, and I'm saying that it doesn't have to be that way. You know, if there's something that's important enough to a community, it's up to people, not just candidates, but it's up to the entire community to come together and vote for the best interests of their community, however they may see fit. So I don't want to discount personal responsibility. Okay, but, but, people are not being led um, I think on that, a leash and right. people have to be responsible for their decisions. Well, so maybe the, the motto of our so, local democratic committee should no longer be vote A all the way, it should be vote what's very important to you and make sure you're looking at local issues but the well. personal responsibility is the fact that people don't exercise the personal responsibility this is the answer to that because we all, we all have the we all have the opportunity to vote i think it's never been easier to vote and i'm all for all those things that have happened i think that's great the absentee ballots all those types of things the early voting all good but people they're trying to find a different way to make you exercise your responsibility. And I think probably the, the people in this room don't represent the typical person, typical voter in our town. And they're probably more educated and more involved in local issues. And there's so many, you can see the turnout, you know, the difference between a local turnout 
if for a local election, which may be 30% or versus 70% for a national presidential election, those other 40%, they have the opportunity. So, but, Holly, did you have any thoughts on it? Well, yes. Um, first, I'm, I'm trying to disregard the fact that I think it's been implied multiple times that my election was not exactly legitimate. It was based on I think national he, politics. I think, I think, I think he benefited from being in the even year. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I don't... I'm not gonna say that I didn't. Okay, but, so that, that's all I'm saying. But I don't think that that means that the vote of the community last year was not representative of the community. I, think, I couldn't tell you. So I'm just trying to put that okay. aside. I do, however, generally agree that when someone goes to vote for their local representatives, they need to be considering the local issues and what's important to them. I personally always vote. There's an election, I vote in it. I have no doubt. And New York's structure does put quite a burden on the voter. There are a lot of different election days in different years. I do think that more engagement is better, and I, I would like to give the Assembly and the Senate the benefit of the doubt that they're just looking to engage more voters by consolidating. However, that should not come at the cost of local elections reflecting the local issues. You know, so I'm going to be circulating that petition to the board. So. I don't know who's going to sign off on it, but I guess you'll be able to see it's all public. Yeah, it's just really disconcerting. Okay. I thank you for the time. I, I, <laughs> and and, and uh, I thank you for all your feedback. All right. Thank you so much. All right. So, any other public comment we did that's not related to 50 North Greeley? Okay. So, now can I have a motion to please open the public hearing on the 50 North Greeley uh, net zero carbon legislation? I move to open the public comment. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, so before we get started, I want to just give a brief history, but remind people, um, if you want to look at the current model of the proposal, it is right there in the corner, hopefully not being knocked over by Mr. Fleischer. If you do want to comment, there are also cards back there, index cards. If you can just write your name on those cards uh, and your address, they come up here. I read them so it's an orderly fashion. Um, when we do speak, we're not going to berate each other. We are going to speak about the legislation, speak about the project, um, not speak about uh, personalities or um, be mean to each other. Um, all right. In terms of history, I just wanted to give a little brief. I was going to oh. ask, is there going to be a public comment section regarding where we speak regarding the... This. Yes. yes. Okay, great. Yes, so yes. So if you have fill out a card. There's index cards in the corner over there, so just put your name and then pass it over to yeah. our town administrator. So we just have... If you would, anyone who would like to speak, please write your name on a card and okay. it'll be handed. We forgot yeah. to check to see if there was a raised hand. Oh, uh, were there any raised hands for public comment? Oh, there was. I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, okay, it's not going to be part of the public hearing, but we will look at that. Yes, thanks. I can't tell who that is. Roxanne, yeah, we can. You're unmuted. I want to comment on the North Greenleaf thing. Yes, we're not there yet. Okay. That's, that's what's coming up next. So hang on and we will make sure to call on you. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so just to give a little brief history. So the 50 North Greeley, that is the, for those of you who are unaware, that is the former Rite Aid building. Um, the town board was introduced to this project in November, 2021, when we received a letter from the property owner, Don Feinberg, describing a proposed development. On June 22nd, 2022, the applicant team made a more detailed presentation at a town board work session. Um, I think it's fair to say that the presentation was well received and the town board did encourage the property owner unanimously to engage in outreach efforts, particularly with the residents of 149 <coughs> King Street, 
so that neighbors <coughs> and residents would be informed. And that, uh, I believe, was done last summer. In September 2022, the town board received a formal application from the property owner to move forward with the project. In November 2022, the town board referred that application to the Newcastle, thank you, and the Westchester County Planning Boards and declared its intent to be lead agency under SECRA. Um, at each step of the way, the town board has expressed support for the project and um, each of our resolutions moving this project forward to date have been unanimous. Um, in January 2023, we had two joint work sessions with our planning board, uh, during which certain planning board members expressed um, some concerns. And since then, the planning board has continued to uh, have comments about that. Um, at some point, and I didn't write down the date, the town board also unanimously um, formed a working group consisting of two members of the, of the town board, two members of our planning board, and two members of our architectural review board, or board of architecture review, whichever way you like to say it, um, to work with the applicant to uh, collaboratively uh, look at issues that are coming up both in public hearings and, uh, and concerns that are expressed by, by those boards. Um, the last one of those meetings was actually this past Thursday. Um, and again, the two members of the planning board, uh, architecture review board and the town board were there, uh, as well as our, our planning department and council and the applicant. And that was a public meeting. And uh, it was, it was, I think the meeting actually went pretty well. And uh, the thought of the, of the um, working group was that we wanted to work collaboratively with the developer uh, to incorporate comments that we're hearing at the public hearing uh, to see what changes can be made to the to the project. Um, and at that meeting, uh, a couple significant things um, were brought up. And I, I'm saying this now because I also want not all members of it was Ali and I were at or the town board members at that public at the work group meeting. And I do want um, all town board members, I know at least Vicki and Holly, I saw you online watching, um, but I, I am sure everyone has looked at it. I wanted to give the opportunity to speak about it here as well uh, before we open it up to public comments. Um, but again, I think the basic tenets that came out of that meeting uh, were to work collaboratively with the developer um, because we think that by incorporating all comments, we can come up with a project that, that hopefully is really benefit our town and that everyone can, can agree on to some extent. Um, there was a discussion to, and this specifically came actually from the planning board, to really uh, actually increase the amount of retail that's currently being proposed in there to activate um, the street. And we did also learn um, during that meeting that the northernmost building is on top of a county sewer line uh, and the county will not grant an easement over that. So that building will be removed uh, somewhat. And um, green space and the bike rack actually, which is non-activated space, may be moved to that. But that's something that came out as something that we need to work with with the developer and with the with the ARB and with our planning board to all um, look at this together to hopefully make something that the, that the whole community, whether you are initially for or initially against this project, you know, the point of these public meetings, these hearings is to really come together as a community and try to devise a project that really reflects um, the values, the wants, and the needs of our community as a whole. And I think I can speak for everyone on this town board that we really value that and we really value public input and transparency and hearing from from all uh, all members so uh, before we move to public comment i wanted to open it up if anyone on the board had any um thoughts about that uh or comments and then we'll move to to the public comment which again if you want to speak please fill out a card i would just make a general statement that it demonstrates that there's a willingness to adapt and change and modify and consider uh, many different factors to wherever we end up, whatever that may be. And there's obviously some controlling factors that we that are beyond us, but um, 
it just demonstrates just that. That's all. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I do want to say a few things. And first, um, you know, before I say anything, I just want to establish that everyone who's been involved in this process has had good intentions. So if there's anything that I should say that should contradict anything, I just want to start off from the place of everyone coming to this re really well intentioned from the town board, the developer, the owner, um, and we all want to work together. Um, so, you know, I'm just going to, and I'm not going to take too long, but I just want to reiterate something that I've been saying from the very beginning of this process, which is that zoning is a function of a town board or a municipality for the benefit of the public. We know our downtown is in dire need of revitalization. We need more people downtown, more residential, more retail, more attractive public gathering spaces. And so we need to create zoning legislation with the public, which I believe should be a shared vision to properly accomplish the goals. And so to do this effectively, I believe we need to look at the big picture. The problem is that the town board has never developed a policy for North Greeley or anywhere in the Hamlet really, other than the form based code, which you know I didn't agree with. Um, the problem here is that the development is determining the policy. That is backwards. We are trying to fit our policy, our legislation into the project. And it should be the other way around. North Greeley is a really important area in town. It's flat, it's walkable, it has great potential. We have architects and experts on urban design, on our advisory board, we have a town planner. And to come up with the best outcome for the town, we should enlist everyone. So I think as one of our planning board members said at the last working group meeting, he asked, what are we building in terms of a neighborhood? And we've never, ever considered this. So I would, I don't want to stop considering the project, but I think it should be considered in the context of a greater picture. And I think we need to look at that greater picture as soon as possible. Um, in terms of the working group, uh, the working group is a collaborative group in order to get things done to be efficient but it's a public body, so it needs to have notice. It needs to have an agenda. Okay. Um, so my concern about the working group at this point is that the last meeting accomplished a lot of things. So there were directions that were given either to the developer or to the planning board. So for instance, to add retail beyond the 4,000 square feet, to reconfigure different entrance for the building, consider the Metro North commuter lot for parking, uh, look at parking across the street. So in other words, a lot of decisions were made that did not include the town board. Maybe no decisions were and made at all. there was direction given to the developer to do a lot of things. And I am not surprised that the developer would be at this point really frustrated. But this working group, and all well-intentioned, by making really important decisions within those meetings has essentially cut off the lead agency. And I'm not saying you're doing anything wrong, but the town board is not at the table during the meetings where important direction is being given. So at this point, and I'm really open and I'm flexible in my thinking, but at this point, I am not in favor just so everyone knows, of these working groups, of the working group structure. I believe the town board should be present at these meetings because we are the lead agency and I see the project taking off in various directions with the town board not really being there. And this is a board governance structure. We don't have a, a governance structure where you have, for instance, an executive branch on one side and a legislative branch on the other. Decisions are made by a five-member board, so we all have to agree, and we all need to be there if the developer is being given direction. And I don't want the developer guy who's sitting right here to be jerked around, to be told one thing and then to be told another when we're at another meeting. So I believe we need to rethink this idea of a working group, and I can be in the minority in that, but that's what I believe. Thank you. Um, Alan? 
I'm not saying that you shouldn't, that we can't rethink the working group by any stretch, like the more the merrier, as far as I'm concerned. Like whoever wants to be there can be there. In fact, you and Holly were there and at any point could have, you were on Zoom, but you could have been in person, you could have shared your comments, your questions, like I, I don't, I don't meeting. think it was, um, it's not clear to me, sorry to interrupt, but it's not clear to me that we would be equal participants around the table. That wasn't clear at all. If that's well, the case, then we could all be At the there. onset of the working group, we discussed who would be on it. Everybody had, other than Lisa, the four other members of this board, had every opportunity to join the working group. I had just expressed an interest because it would be like my first project as a town board member, but that didn't preclude anyone at any point from saying that they wanted to join, they had comments. And in fact, I said, I've done my homework because I'm, I'm on this working group, but everybody has had access to the same information, to the architectural review board members, to the planning board members. We've had ample opportunity. So I'm, if, if you feel like you're being left out, jump in at any time, but I don't agree that that was ever the impression made or given. You and Holly were both there. You could have called, emailed, texted, raised your hand over Zoom. I would have been eager to hear what your questions mm -hmm. were. So if you got that impression, I'm sorry, but I, I just disagree with how you're characterizing the formation of the working group and our progress going forward. I feel the same way about members of the planning board. If other members besides Tom Curley and Eldad wanted to join, I would welcome their opinions. Bob Kirkwood, who's not on the working group, has sent emails with his comments before. So I guess I just I just don't agree with the assertion that anybody's being left out. Um, that's not how I work. That's not how I operate. I have made it very clear many, many times that I welcome feedback from anybody, whether you agree with me or not. And like I said, you and Holly both did attend over Zoom. Never, I've never heard up until right now a desire for anybody else to, to be added or had an interest beyond getting updates from us. So if you had felt that way, I wish you would have shared and I wish that you felt comfortable enough to jump in last Thursday, but going forward, if you want to be involved, you want to be involved. And I also want to say, we didn't reach any consensus conclusion. No decisions were made. We didn't talk about what we were going to do in terms of parking across the street. Um, you know, there were some tweaks. There were some tweaks that were suggested. And before we could even decide on them, I think the developer wanted to let us know if they were even possible. I think that's kind of where we left off. And we needed to schedule another meeting. So. Yeah, I just want to make one clarification. Right, but I, I do, think I there do was, want to clarify. Can, I just wanted, there was just a misstatement in what you said. Never was direction given to the developer to, to look at parking for their project across the street, nor was there ever direction given to the developer to utilize the uh, train station parking lot for their development specifically. So that didn't happen. What did happen was we asked uh, the planning board, if they wanted to start looking at potentially what could happen in that that one town owned property there, um, that we would love, you know, just some ideas. But like certainly, the neighborhood. Right, but so certainly anyway. none of that was 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 discussed at the meeting. So I don't want there to be an implication out there that it was. Okay. So um, I want to enlist Ed a little bit. So in the formation of the working group. Um, what was clear is that it would encompass two members of the town board, not just anyone who wanted to be on. And I had no, absolutely no objection to having it be Lisa and Allie. Um, I don't think we knew what form these working group, the working group would take. Uh, it wasn't clear, it was clear to me that the working group would have a certain direction within those meetings, but that's no longer the case. So I don't think that Holly and I, or Jeremy, if he had attended by Zoom, would have the same opportunity to have discussions around the table as the people who were charged to be there. So, I mean, I suppose we could weigh in just like any other member of the community providing a comment. That is not the same as being around the table, having a discussion. I'm sorry, so I really disagree. That is not true. I strongly disagree. You are one disagree. of five votes. I'm sorry, so, I, you know, I yeah. totally disagree. So, as well. Anyway, so is it the case then that the entire town board 
can attend and participate in the working group because that was not the case. Yes, it is a public meeting. Members of the public can show up, which well, they I'm did. Asking Ed you were welcome point. to do that. You so didn't Ed, do that. But. We formed the working group and stated that only two members of the town board could be on the working group. And therefore, it wouldn't be like a town board meeting. So if we're now saying that every single member of the town board can be there and participate, wouldn't that now be a town board meeting? As I recall the discussion when we formed the working group, um, there was never any consideration given <coughs> it not being a public meeting. It was always the case that it was going to be a publicly noticed uh, publicly held and that's not my question though, but yes meeting i think the question then and, and, and now is what's the best tool for the job for the task and i think the discussion then was we had had two joint meetings with the planning board where both full boards sat in this room in january and had a very what i thought productive positive mm -hmm. discussion mm -hmm. but then when we moved into i guess it was February, um, the uh, the agenda for that first working group <coughs> meeting was really to, to blue pencil the legislation, and we did that. We we edited, made changes, just wordsmithing and, and, and kicking around different ideas. And I, I think the idea was that it was would be more efficient and productive in a smaller group. Now, at the last working group meeting last week, we didn't have an agenda. And the so it was just to discuss the project. Well, and then the, so the discussion was a bit more wide ranging and a lot of time was spent talking about approach. Um, and it was similar to the my mind to the conversation that the boards had back in January, sort of more of a high level. Is this the right approach as opposed to more nuts and bolts? This is the legislative language. Do we like this the way this is said that word? So I think going forward, the question for the board is what do you need? Uh, what are the next uh, deliverables, the next steps, what information do you need, what work has to get done, and what's the best way to accomplish that? Well, and to add on to that, that's the reason, and no decisions were made, and that's one of the major reasons that I wanted to open it up now to have that discussion, because it did evolve, as conversations often do, into kind of larger, big picture things, which is why we're making sure right now to bring it back, even though you were on the call, to bring it back right now to make sure we have those discussions because every member of this town board has one vote. No decisions have been made. No one's going behind your back and doing anything. Everything thus far, as we've said, have been unanimous votes of this five-member town board, and we will continue to have votes of this five-member town board. So I don't no see how anything could be behind me. anyone's back. That, that, that's I know, not but possible. you're interrupting me. So, um, so yeah. no, you know, no decisions have been made. Now, with regard to you know rezoning, as you said, I think that we've been talking about the need to create additional housing opportunities in the Chappaqua Hamlet for years. In fact, it's a major goal of our 2017 comprehensive plan. I think it's very, very important. And while I'm not opposed to looking at rezoning the other side of North Greeley, I think we need a bit of a reality check because firstly, that was something that people didn't want and one of the reasons the form-based code was, made, was voted down. And I think most of those lots between the Verizon building and the post office, especially on that side of the street that are most impactful to 149 King Street, are one-tenth of an acre in size and privately owned. So until someone can combine multiple lots, they have very limited redevelopment potential. And frankly, whether or not you think that's the wrong approach to zoning, I think that's kind of a false narrative because right now, we have an application in front of us, and we have the opportunity to do something here that meets a lot of goals of our comprehensive plan and a lot of goals of our community, and even additional goals, like nobody discussed how difficult it would be to actually build a building downtown and the impact on, yet again, our merchants and restaurants and everyone else. And this is an opportunity for something interesting that can essentially be built off site and and put up without much impact to the town. So I think there are a lot of things that this checks and it's in front of us now. So looking at this doesn't preclude us from looking at additional zoning, but I think I, I'm not willing 
to tell this developer goodbye because we want to spend the next two years looking at, or three years or more, looking at a large scale zoning, which we sort of did, and it was voted down in the form based code. I would rather look at what's in front of us, have the opportunity to do something great, and use that as a test case to move things forward. And frankly, with all due respect to all of the property owners in town, our architecture is not awesome. And this is the opportunity to bring something that is really kind of cutting edge to town. And maybe it enhances our town and allows then other property owners to say, I'm going to kind of step it up a little bit with my property, even if I don't change my zoning, to make our town more beautiful. So that, that's sort of my view on it. But again, it's something that the town board has to discuss, and we each get a vote. So I, so I was watching the working group meeting, and this may be my misunderstanding of the model of a working group, but I did not have any expectation that I was part of the discussion, even if I was there. I, I understood it to be a focused discussion on the legislation. So I was concerned when the conversation kind of became almost existential about the project and the overall direction. Because um, as Ed said, you know, taking a pen to the legislation, that was my expectation of what was happening. But that said, I, I think that we need to do something and it's urgent. So I'm glad that we are looking at this. But I really think that we should be looking at something somewhere between one property and the entire hamlet for rezoning in parallel. Um, so well, that's why we are also, we do have RFPs out and we have interviews scheduled to also look at development of town owned property mm -hmm. at the train station, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. But in terms of getting back to kind of what was discussed and focusing this a little bit, what are the views of the town board to those larger questions that were discussed in terms of, you know, do we want to try to activate the street a little more? Do, um, you know, what what are your general views about the, that, the issues that were discussed at the meeting that you all were participating in? I, I, I heard the developer say that he was going to think through some things, and I, I think I just want to hear more still before I have a defined opinion there. I, I don't profess to know everything, despite what somebody think about my opinions formally the form based code. Um, that said, there's a there's a lot to learn, and I just want to voice something again that I don't think Vicky was. It may have come across a little bit of an attack, but that wasn't her intention. I think that she wants to be involved. We all want to be involved, and I also misunderstood too about what we could do and as a full board or as to a smaller, smaller piece of the board. But at the same time, I think it enables us to be much more efficient when we're in a smaller group and, and report yeah. back and forth. Everyone's got the right intentions. I don't want to get bogged down in this and have this become a, a smaller issue of what we've dealt with in the past. Ultimately, everyone up here is going to make a decision one way or another. And I think it's critical at this point to Instead of what do you think now, what do you think now, let's hear from the, from the residents, let's hear from the developer, and let's just move this process forward. Yeah, that was Great. a good segue, thank you. Um, so again, if you would like to speak, please write your name on a card, I will call your name. Uh, again, you have issues, complaints, thoughts, praise, whatever you want for the project, that's what we want to hear. You want to denigrate any individuals, we don't want to hear that. Um, okay, so the first person to speak today is uh, Matthew Weissman. Hello there, everyone. Um, I just want to say how important I see that this housing project is to this town, allowing more people of many different financial backgrounds to be given access to housing, helps to make our town more inclusive, and helps more people to benefit, benefit from things like our education system and the, excuse me, on the general financial stability that Newcastle provides. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you. Um, before I call the next person, I just want to say that it kind of warms my heart to have young people here and getting involved in town government and, and being passionate about issues. And I don't know what you're going to say, but I'm happy that you, you are all here. So thank you for coming. Uh, John Pallara. Not that I'm not happy you're here, too. <laughs> <laughs> 
a young person? <laughs> Everyone's young. It's if you got great hair. No matter if you're mine. Young. young. <laughs> okay, my name's John Clower. I live on Hamilton Road. I've lived here for six years, which I felt like it was a long time, but every time I talk to someone, they've lived here a lot longer than me. It's either because they were born here and stay here, or like my spouse who's been here for 35 years, um, came here from a much busier place to raise a family, okay? Now, if you stand on the corner of South Greeley and King Street, every building there's only one or two stories tall. So I don't think it's an overstatement to say a four-story building on a, uh, with a very large footprint is grossly out of place in that spot. I think it would just loom over the center of town. So when the form-based code was proposed last year, it was rejected because the, everybody was clearly against it. It was obvious that this was a huge overreach. Um, and, but I want to emphasize, I am not, and I think a lot of people are not against development. I think development is really important and we need development exactly for the reasons you said. But I don't think um, tall buildings and parking garages are in character at all with what Chappaqua is and why people want to be here. There are better ways to accomplish these goals and I think there's a lot of ideas out there um, to accomplish that. So I feel the building, I feel this building is, is literally right out of the form-based code and it should be rejected in the same way because it is a gross violation of Chappaqua zoning. It's as simple as that. Um, so as a, as a citizen of Chappaqua, I stand firmly against this proposal and I would like to see us to come up with creative ways that accomplish the goals you're talking about but are more in context with why people want to live in Chapel. All right, thank you, John. Okay, uh, next we have Chuck Napoli. Um, I, I, really, I only have one question, my first question tonight will only be one question. And uh, you started off with dates of 2021, 22, 23, but um, last, last week or the last public meeting, it was reference made to this project being on the boards for five years, five years ago. And so, and I don't know if you will remember that, but it was most definitely part of, as, as John says, part of the form-based code um, um, development. The, the full, the full, um, well, as were the whole 72 acres. Well, as, as part, it was part of the full build out, and um, it's still part of the 72 acres, but not part of the build out. <laughs> as John says, it's still there. However, the question, and this is the question, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll sit down and maybe you have to research it, but who said? That this is, should be built. Who was, you know, who, where, where, who created the the words that say, Mr. Feinberg, we want you to develop this property like this. Who was the person who encouraged this development back in the form based code five years ago? And I need that answer. Does anybody know? I mean, it, it, it didn't come up out of the blue. He was asked to do this. And so I'd like to know if, if, if anybody knows who did the asking. I have no idea that anyone asked him to do anything. It's his property. He's allowed well, he to said do that. And he, was did, asked, he was asked right? to do this. He did go out of business. So well, no, he said that he was asked to do this project. So, no I have no idea. Maybe we have to, maybe yeah, he should, no idea, but he, maybe he could tell us. But that was my one question, my first question. Why is that germane to this? I mean, well, because he's, he's a property owner, he's allowed to want to develop his property. We think and we're it. allowed to. Well, five years ago, it. it was a different project, a different, a different use for the property. Five years ago, it was part of the, the overall full build out, and we all know it's still the same exact project with a few tweaks um, 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 of what was on the form based code. 
It was the same project that was promoted and drawn and formed its code, and it, here, it, stays, it stays here today. The only tweak that was done is that they, they didn't build a five-level parking garage. So anyway, I need the answer. Who came up with this idea? Who told Mr. Feinberg to do this? I need that. I need, I need somebody to find that out for me. Can I? Can I get a commitment from somebody? To... Why do you need that? Why is that relevant to the whether or not you like this building and how this property should be developed? Uh, yeah, well, I, I think if it, if it was a if it was the consultants that proposed the form-based code, I would like to know if it was. And if it was, then is this not, if the form-based code doesn't exist, why does this exist? Chuck, this is not, the form-based code was a giant redevelopment plan for a 72 acre I'm hamlet. Sorry, this I'm is, sorry, Ms. This Lee. is a proposal for Wrong. one building. Yeah, guess what? You have, as, as it was clearly stated, you have a form, a big form. Um, that is kind of imposing on North Greeley Avenue, and you're writing a code to that form. Let me tell you something. That's form-based code. And we're, instead of the other way around, code, then form, we, are, uh, we got it all backwards. You are doing form-based coding right now, whether you like it or not, it's a form that you're writing a code. Watch, you didn't even write the code. They did. You've got a form, and you're writing a code to that form. <laughs> It's totally backwards. And what the problem with form-based code was, there was no public involved. And we're doing the same thing. Don't think this is public engagement. Yeah, it isn't, because the, the, you, you actually you don't even know what a real public engagement would look like. Are you not standing there in front of the public, engaging with the people? Yes, I am. Really, I really am. But the public engagement to create the context, create the form. This is not the place to create the context of form and the three-dimensional space that forms create. This is this is this is listening to, to opinions. Um, it's a public hearing, but I don't know if there's much listening going on. But one thing's for sure: that working group um, is is made up of people that um, that that are going to legislate it. I mean, they. They, they are gonna, they're the lead agency, they're the legislators, and they're designers. That's kind of like a conflict. I think what's missing is a few more people, that's all. And, and I, would, I would love for a few more people from the public to be invited to your little work groups. Now, I still want to know who generated this form five years ago. Thank you. I, 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 but I don't have an answer for you. Can we find out? I don't think we can ever find that out. But I I can call. Well, maybe Mr. Feinberg can tell us. OK. Uh, Naveen Arjun. Uh, so I think that rezoning the whole area and possibly, or just building a, an apartment building on that complex would be a great idea because it wouldn't just make the community more diverse, but it would also increase density, which could lead to more businesses opening in the town, which could like, mean more taxes for the area. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Short, sweet, to the point. Thank you. OK, I apologize. I cannot read your first name. Is it Millie Schwartz? Yep. OK. So, uh, so I fully agree that our town center does need revitalization, and that's why I'm in favor of a parking garage or some kind of like apartment building because I mean it, it is a big opportunity to really get activity in the center of town going. It brings diversity, it brings people, it brings money into our town. And I mean, I, I also, that's one thing. I mean, it's, it's an economical thing. It's very good for, for everyone. It's mutually beneficial. People get to live here. There's more money being put into our town. And I, I mean, also, like, this town, like, I think everyone deserves a place in this town. I, I, I think Chappaqua is special to a lot of different people for um, 
a lot of different reasons. But, um, I mean, to me, like, I, I love it for the reason that, like, I ride my bike around town. I wave hi to neighbors. I see, like, all the beautiful scenery. And, I mean, how could we possibly deny this to other people? I mean, aren't, shouldn't they be allowed to experience this, too? Like, it would be weighing pretty heavily on my conscience if I was just saying, like, oh, we're going to have this, but you, you can't. Like, I just don't think that's fair in a model and, and like the most simple moral grounds. Thank you. Right, thank you. Um, I just wanted to just put it out there that there's no parking garage currently being contemplated in this proposal. Uh, so I just wanted, I've heard it a couple times, so I just wanted to clarify that. I also just want to say, um, it's my understanding that these are luxury units that are being proposed. Well, 12% are affordable. Just when 12% are affordable, there will be four affordable units. No, but I think it's not. Is it five? It's oh, five. It's five. five. But, but the others are meant to be luxury, $5,000 as well. Just saying. Just. So our current code requires 10% affordable, affordable housing. This is 12%, I believe. OK, uh, Cassiopeia Sant. Um, hi, uh, so my friends and I have come here tonight to voice our unequivocal support for multifamily and affordable housing. Um, you know, as and by extension, our support for the 50 North, uh, North Bedford development. Green. North, sorry, North Green development, thank you. Um, so we, two, three of the biggest arguments that I've heard here tonight are that it, well, it's like, Big footprint is unsustainable. Um, it doesn't fit aesthetically with the rest of the town, and that it's um, luxury housing. So I believe all of, all three of these concerns are completely unfounded. Um, it's not unsustainable because it's literally a carbon neutral development. Uh, the legislation that allows for its construction mandates that it is carbon neutral, meaning like zero emissions. So it's not unsustainable, um, and. It, the claim about the, the luxury apartments, the maximum size of these apartments are two bedroom. That doesn't mean they're not luxury, um, but I would like to say many more are also studio apartments and one bedroom. And it's also essential to mention that it has set aside units for low income, affordable housing, and quite a few of that, certainly more than the town minimum. Um, so I think it's even kind of elitist for people to strike this down as just another luxury development unit from the comfort of their own single family homes built on properties that are between one and two acres. Um, and the most infuriating part, oh, and as to the, um, the aesthetic um, of it, I, I, I really don't think that's even relevant because this is multifamily affordable housing that we are concerned about. To me, it, that's like the material issue here, not how it looks compared to other homes in Chappaqua. Um, so this is, the most infuriating part of this is that if people say there are better ways of, of creating affordable housing in our town, um, but we had a, a workable plan um, with the form-based code and people said no, they struck that down. So uh, at this point, this 50 North Greeley development is all we have left. Um, it may not be perfect, but it is the last chance of progress in a housing struggle um, where we are fighting for multifamily and affordable housing that has been all but destroyed. And for this last hope of progress, we will fight tooth and nail. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just say whether you people, whether people agree with you, all of you or not, you really were terrific, all of you to get up here and share your thoughts and opinions. And that's not being condescending or patronizing. You really genuinely made solid points and did a good job in delivering it. Thank you for coming. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yes. All right, Lynn Lambert. So, um, I want to go back to some things that you will hate <laughs> because I do think the character of what is built is important. I think that 
one of the reasons that we chose this town to move to instead of many other towns in the area is that we liked that vibe. And so to me, character is important. It pleases me. I go for walks and, and look at the, the old houses and I love them. Um, size is also really important to me. Um, the walkthrough that we did, I hope everybody's seen the, the, the um, computer walkthrough. Um, it just confirmed to me that it's too much too tall and much too wide and it would be looming and I am unhappy about that. Um, I think we should have um, some housing units there for sure. I think an apartment building is appropriate, but this like really seems way too much. Um, jumping around a little bit, I like what Vicky said about the this should be driven by the people and what we the residents want. And um, one of the things that we really hoped for, those of us who were opposed to the form based code, was a charrette which was going to hear the voices of the residents. And that hasn't happened, which makes me sad because there's an opportunity, uh, something that I felt like we were <laughs> promised that we could do a charrette and that all the residents who care to participate would have a chance to speak up. And just to tell you, it, it makes me sad too that we haven't had it. And we are interviewing two firms. We had to reissue the RFPs for that, unfortunately. So we have those back and we are waiting to we, we've scheduled the interviews with those firms to do that for town owned land. Well, then this feels a little cart before the horse to me. This is not town owned land. I can't, I but, can say on your house I, I want to put a swimming pool. No, but I, I got to, but in terms of what we want the town to be, yeah. I didn't think that the charrette would only be about town owned land. I thought it would be about, we've got some places that are, are primed for development. What kind of development would the residents like? You know, I agree right. with you, Lena. Charette right. could have informed the zoning. We yeah, I, have I, would, first. I would. So hope. I, I do agree, and I wish we had done a charrette for much more than than the public lands. We could have done that to inform the zoning legis legislation. We, I don't see why we couldn't still do that. And so I um, don't just put my voice to that. Um, a couple of other things I just want to mention. Yes, everybody's very concerned that it w it, we wouldn't have enough parking even within what's been uh, described in this um, proposal. Um, that street is so narrow. I had my, my car scraped several years ago just driving down the street by somebody opening their door. And that's, there's no proposal to make that street any wider. And all of us know that street. So how are we gonna support more traffic going two ways on that street? Looking at it, all I could think is, well, maybe you take the parking off of one side of the street. Well, that would exacerbate the problem of parking for the local uh, retailers and restaurants. So that seems like a terrible idea, but there's nothing to be done about that as far as I can see. And that's going to be a problem. Um, I do think that when 88% of the proposed apartments are going to be five to six thousand dollars a month. That's not bringing in a diverse group of people. I know I'm a middle class person living here in town and I couldn't afford any of that. And when I supposedly retire and become an empty nester, I really couldn't afford it. So I don't think we're bringing in diverse people. We're bringing in uh, more rentals than we have and we could use some more rentals. but we could have them be smaller, maybe therefore more affordable. So that's my take on that. And with all due respect to you guys who rock. Um, so one of my other questions is and maybe um, two. One is, I hope we're gonna see an updated model if the, the most northernmost uh, chunk of this building is going to be removed, it would be helpful. To, to see what it would look like then. I don't know how much of it is going to impact the, the size without seeing something. And the last thing I want to say is I'm very, very glad that those of you who are on the working committee and attended that meeting, first of all, were there. But I'm glad that you felt that it was a collaborative meeting. However, in terms of 
of making progress to find to finding maybe a compromise that the residents, the board could agree on for this building. I was really disheartened at the last meeting when Mr. Feinberg said basically it's this building or nothing. So that did not seem like a, an in, you know a good maybe that's a good negotiating tactic I don't know but to me it felt like I'm going to take my ball and go home if I don't get what I want and that is not collaborative and that did not endear Mr. Feinberg to me and yes I I'm, I'm not against capitalism and I think he should have an opportunity and we would could benefit from the development of this proper property properly but I think this would be overreach. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, just, just to clarify one thing, and I, I saw how Martin Wilbur and the examiner characterized that. I personally, I can't speak for the rest of the board, but I personally did not take what Don Feinberg says as an ultimatum. I just took it as a statement that this is my property and this is kind of what I want to build, and I don't have to build Chuck Napoli's design if I don't want we don't, he doesn't have to build, we don't have to say yes, but he can also just decide to rent it. I mean, the, the you know, financials are that at some point they're going to need to make money on that building. So I just took it as him saying, well, this is what I really want to do. I'm not interested in building a different, that's another architect is doing, but just saying our option, his options, I didn't take it as, a, as an ultimatum. In fact, I think that Ali and everyone at the working group meeting, and I'm sure the town board members who participated as well, will, will reiterate and recognize that the developer was actually and is willing to collaborate to make changes um, based on community input. So I, I didn't take it as that. I, I don't know if anyone else did, but I, I actually did not think the way it was reported was appropriate or what I, I or what here. happened. I didn't read about it. Yeah, that's not how I took it. Yeah. Um, okay, <laughs> next is Paul Chacho. And uh, as he's making his way up, if anyone else wants to speak, please fill out a card that's in the back corner over there. And, and, and then we're going to get to, yeah, online too. Um, but if you're in person and want to speak, please fill out a card back there and hand it over to uh, to this table over here to Jill and Christina. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Okay, right, thanks. Um, yeah, my name is Paul Chacho. I live on Elizabeth Street here in Chappaqua. I've uh, been here 13 years and um, born and raised in Hawthorne, so a little bit longer than 35 years. <laughs> um, but um, I'm, I'm kind of new to this game. I wasn't even aware that this was uh, being developed until I was at the farmer's market with my daughter and I was walking through and I saw some type of rendering um, uh, about it. I believe the supervisor reports. <laughs> oh, okay. I the town newsletter. <laughs> Clearly. Um, so there's a couple things that um, I'm, I'm concerned about and one thing that, um, that I just wanted to raise, I'm wondering the correlation to what I do. Because I, I work in tech in AI. And there's a lot of conversation around that now. Uh, yeah, exactly. There's a lot of conversation <laughs> around that now. Um, where is it going? You know, and specifically, what are the guidelines and guardrails around it? What's the threshold to the point that we say, okay, we have to pause and think? So that's just as a as a resident, that's just something that I wanted to bring up because I may not have all the information, and I'm hearing a couple different things here and there. But it seems like, um, at, at least in terms of AI, that's being figured out and there's concern as to where it's going. It seems like there might be some correlation here too with from what I just heard today about is the cart before the horse? Are there guidelines and guardrails put up for, uh, for this type of development? And also is there some type of threshold to the point where um, as a town board or us as residents uh, can say, this is a, a major concern, or no, we, we don't head in this direction. So that being said, um, all, from what I've seen, I checked out the rendering back there and the one picture at the uh, farmer's market. I do feel it is too large. Um, uh, as, a, you know, as a resident of the town and growing up in the area, I'm all for progress. And yes, that area 
does need to have some type of development. But I just hope us, as everyone who lives here, our our children, which is you know the kids, right, for showing up and 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 speaking your voice, that we could collectively together make something that we're and build something that we're proud of, that these kids can have their kids in this town be proud of. Um, personally, I don't think that the height of the buildings or the breadth of them um, fit with that. So I just want to thank you very much for the time. Just wanted to bring that up and thanks. Thank you. And Paul, go online, mynewcastle.org, subscribe to the town newsletters. And to, if you look at the archives, two weeks ago, there's also a video and it shows a virtual kind of streetscape that also can help it from two different directions that also might just help inform how it's going to look. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Um, all right, we're going to take a pause in person and go to a couple people online since they've been patiently waiting. I'd like to talk to Roxanne first since she's been patiently waiting for a while. Thank you. My name is Roxanne Saidi. I hope I'm being heard. Um, I've lived in Chappaqua over 15 years, and I am very much in favor of this uh, new development. We've got to start somewhere. We can't always end up in a straight line or create a straight line, but the need for housing and shelter is huge. I wish there were more affordable units in this development, uh, but we're going to go round and round in circles before we come up with the whole town code. So I think we need to start somewhere. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and also whoever's the 914238, I can't read, 5176, I need my reading test done. Um, if that person could speak. The talk. Yes, you've been on for a while. Um, I'm a long time resident. My name is what, Ellen. What is, your, what is your name? I'm sorry. Ellen Schlossberg. Oh, hi, Ellen. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, both the local law and the design of the building are a dream of the property owner, not what this town is about. The comprehensive plan spells out what fits in a hamlet. No ultimatum should change the mind of the town board. Retail is certainly better than an overpowering building that may belong in an urban environment, not our hamlet. Please stop wasting time and town money on this idea. A better idea will become available, just as what happened at Chappaqua Crossing. The planning board should steer any future project on North Greeley, including site development, not the town board. They have the expertise to benefit us all. Having lived in town for 51 years, I have stayed because of our identity. Going forward, we are not a modern entity and this idea will spoil our historic town, founded in 1730. Also, for those who do not know, the parking lot across the Susan Lawrence is part privately owned and has at least one easement for access. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Kate Dorsch? Hi. Thank you so much. Um, I uh, just wanted to say that I'm in favor of this. Um, I really like what Roxanne said. I would say I have to agree with most of what she said. Um, I think we have to start somewhere. So um, I'm totally in favor of more housing. Um, and I think we have to start with this. Of course, more affordable housing would be great, but this would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Suzanne Chazen. Suzanne, wake up. Suzanne, if you can unmute yourself. What's that, Suzanne? You want this built now? Okay. <laughs> Yes. yes, we hear you. Oh, great. Hi, I'm Suzanne Chazen, and I just want to say thanks for all you're doing. I really do appreciate it. 
hear me or am I okay? Um, I I just want to say a couple things. I want to clarify that I, I, in the, all the times I've heard this, no one is against development. Not a single person that I have heard speak is against development. I am not against development. I think the key here is the size, the scope, and the out of characterness of this development. And I'd like to think of it as a room. If you have a living room in your house, you don't go out and buy a sofa and just say, I like this sofa. This sofa is great, it's modern, it's beautiful, it's really big, but I love it. And then try to figure out how it's gonna fit into your room because guess what, nothing else is gonna fit. And I feel that this building is going to actually rob that neighborhood. I feel that what um, Vicki said is absolutely true, that we're not thinking in terms of a neighborhood. We're not creating that whole concept of the neighborhood of how the parking fits, how all the merchants fit, how the other businesses can fit in. I think it's absolutely fine to develop that property. It's absolutely fine to have an excused housing. But the problem is, is that size and scope robs any chance of future development of a neighborhood. So I think that's really important. The other thing is I have really not gotten the sense, I know you keep talking about collaboration and I really appreciated that. And I'm sure everyone is trying, but when you do read in the paper, and I know you say that's not true, but I have not seen substantive changes come about so far. I know we're talking about adding more retail, but how does that help if you can't add more parking? Um, we're talking about maybe dropping a little because of a sewer problem, but I'm not really seeing this real meeting of the minds, substantive collaboration where there's a give and take of, we'll, we'll go for that, you leave this, we'll try this. I really haven't seen that. And that to me is very upsetting. So when I hear collaboration, I feel that it's right now maybe extremely true for everything the board is doing, the planning board and the architectural review board, but I don't feel yet that sense that the owner and the developer are really sitting at that table saying, we genuinely want to collaborate. And as a resident, I feel offended by that. I feel that the community should come first, the residents should come first, and that if the, if the owner really feels any sense of this community other than just to make a quick dollar, and I hope that's not true, that he will try harder to do genuine collaboration, to recognize that you can't just say, I have this large sofa, I'm dumping it in your living room, and what you do with it after that is your problem. Um, so I have a problem with that. And I also want to point out that while I really appreciate a lot of the young speakers tonight, I think it's great that they're speaking. I do want to point out that we are talking about 417 feet of poured concrete, an enormous amount of concrete, uh, a building that is, is uh, as much as 20 feet taller, more than 50% taller than buildings around it. And the number of affordable housing units we will get out of it is four. And the number of workforce housing units we'll get out of it is one. So we are doing a tremendous amount of construction, environmental damage. I don't see much in the way of, of ground level trees or anything. We talk about a green roof, I'll live to see that. Um, the, the, uh, all the greenery is up above for the rent for the residents, has nothing to do with us. We're never gonna see it. It's a dark shadow with no greenery, 417 feet of poured concrete for $5,000 to $6,000 a month units with four affordable housing. So again, I wanna stress, no one is against development, but this is the large sofa you bought at a garage sale. And now you're trying to figure out how to fit it into your tiny little living room. And now everything else is not gonna look too good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Ed, just correct me if I'm wrong. It's it's five affordable and one it's, workforce, correct? Oh, um, I may be, then I, I, I stand corrected. Five then, so. All right, thank you, Suzanne. Uh, Cynthia? Hello. You need to unmute. Okay, hi, did that work? Yes. Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Cynthia Seamus. I have a couple of things that I'd just like to say quickly. Uh, first of all, I, I hear a lot of people saying that the height of this building is too big for the surroundings, but the surroundings are one and two stories and these are not historic buildings down there. Um, the primarily those buildings are mid-century. There are a few that are in the 1920s, um, but they're all one and two stories. And you know, when we're thinking about a developer or a property owner, as in this case, uh, wanting to develop a property, that 
you have to do that with an eye towards profitability. And it's extremely difficult to make a one or two story building profitable in a new construction. It's basically impossible. Um, I have a little bit of experience with this because we went through this in Manhattan with property that we own. And uh, certainly we would never consider a one or two story building. And uh, in fact, our issues were with setbacks um, on a seven story building. So, uh, Next, this town was not founded in 1730. I just wanted to make that correction. And I know this because my house was built in 1740 and it predates the town. Um, so <laughs> again, there are no historic buildings on the North Greeley, Greeley corridor that I can think of. If someone else knows better, please tell me. Um, but the only downtown historical building that I can think of at all is obviously the Historical Society, which is the Horace Greeley House. Um, so a few points of correction there as far as my recollection. Um, the next thing is that Mr. Napoli was insisting that someone has asked Mr. Feinberg to develop his own property. And um, I believe that the reason nobody knows the answer to that question is because there is no answer to that question. No one asked him to develop his own property. Uh, my recollection being... Uh, in pretty close contact with the town supervisor at that point was that there were no developments, plans, or designs back then at all. Mr. Feinberg called in and talked in a public comment via um, Zoom, just like I'm doing right now, back then, and he talked about wanting to build a mixed-use building and a, a very green building, which was his primary consideration, but that was it. He didn't have plans, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that the last time I heard him speak publicly during the form-based code um, conversations, he had not even hired any architects or designers at all. Uh, I could be wrong about that piece, but I know that there were no plans presented. So I just wanted to make that comment that there is nobody um, who asked him to build this building because this building was developed and designed since then. So, Cynthia, again, uh, as, as I said to Mr. Napoli as well, I, we really want to hear about if you have thoughts about the development or the legislation. Not well, I do. Okay. I, I do. And so the reason that I'm bringing that up, um, but thank you for keeping me on task. <laughs> um, the reason I'm bringing it up is because this is a property owner who you know, as you keep repeating, Lisa, um, has the right to develop his own property. And while I personally really dislike spot zoning, and I understand what other residents are talking about, and, and I kind of agree that I would much rather see uh, a rezoning of North Greeley altogether, the fact is that many of these same residents strongly opposed that as well when the form-based code was reduced significantly to address only that. So anyway, I, I had a couple of comments that I just wanted to make. Those were the ones. My real question though is, how, when is this supposed to, like, where are we in this process? When is this wrapping up? How many more public co comment sessions are we going to have? How many more weeks do we have to have these bright yellow rush signs again? Uh, for the third year in a row all over town and Chuck's choo-choo drawings in his little tent every weekend. Like when, when, where are we in this process? What are, what comes next? Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, the choo-choo just kills me. I, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I, I, uh, I mean, I honestly don't mind the signs much as I didn't then. I think anything that can kind of engage residents and bring ideas to the table and notify residents, clearly not everyone reads the town newsletters. So, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, I think anything that, that can bring, you know, uh, <laughs> visibility to the project i i don't mind but i i hear what you're saying ed do what it, i'm putting you on the spot i mean i think we were thinking uh september well after we finish the public comment portion of the public hearing maybe the board wants mm -hmm. to talk about the path forward because i think we've got some action items that came out of last week's working group meeting mm -hmm. 
Keith Dodd Sikra, Sabrina, myself, Tom Pohl are working on certain aspects of the legislation. Um, the secret information that has to come to you, we have to bring all that to you and basically map it out, map mm -hmm. out next steps. So, you know, I think, well, Cynthia's gone, but I think some of the answers to that question is, you know, when are we going to see revised plan? You know, it's, it's all moving parts. So I think that where it kind of remains to be seen. There's no hard and fast calendar. Sorry. Um, all right. Uh, you know what? I'm going to move back here to our next speaker is Rob Fleischer. That's a lot of pages there. Some actual questions about legislation. Okay. Imagine so he's there. He's there. He uh, Rob something. Fleischer, uh, Newcastle. In section. I'm going to go on page two at the very top. This is the draft of 224.23. They talked about, maybe I'm using the, 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 the look at this uh, incorrectly, but apartments up to 2,000 square feet. Was that the limitation put in here? Am I reading that correctly? Go for it. Is there any reason? Uh, I didn't seen anything or in any of the presentations that, that were proposed that required anything even close to that. I think the, the two bedrooms, which are even large for two bedrooms, I think we're at 1,400 square feet. So is there a reason why we need to have something that much larger? Because it seems like, I guess my concern would be it leads to um, some confusion down the road that, well, the legislation says we could have larger apartments and we shouldn't. So it, it, if, you know, if we don't need to have it any larger than what it is, I'm bringing it down to the minimum that, you know, uh, that works. Uh, on the bottom there on C, when it refers to an accessory use customarily incidental to a permitted principal use on the same lot, that's not ADUs, right? That's not, I'm not saying it's a problem, but is that referring to saying they can have ADUs on that lot, if there's a proper setback and so forth? No. Okay. Just accessory by accessory by another use. That's right. Okay. Uh, the next page, page three, maximum permitted impervious coverage, 85%. Given this is green legislation, that seems like a really high number. Like, <laughs> and I think they proposed it to be a much yeah, I think it was proposed to be much less. Like like in the 30s or 20s or four, or teens? I don't think it was the teens. Well, they had the green roof and they had... So, uh, I, I don't look at that. So I'm not sure why it's 85%. It would seem that it's going to be green, per se, that it could be much, much, much lower. Um, and then there's we talk about there's... The parking here, and there's a fee schedule, and is there a way to kind of discuss exactly how that would kind of work for the commercial portion? I'm not sure I understand exactly. Can, can, can that be explained or expanded upon? The fee parking in uh, lieu is a work in progress. I don't really have any more information on that. Okay. But... What I took from reading what I did, and tell me it's maybe close, maybe it's just totally in progress, was that the idea that there would be potentially a way for the uh, sponsor to pay for parking spots in other, in other places. And as an example, maybe they take a section that we're not being used um, right now of the municipal parking lot, and they, they pay for actual to own, you know, to have allocation of parking there. I'm not sure that if that was the idea, uh, but, you know. The, the concept is that if they can't, they, they likely can park all over the residential on-site. We're talking about the retail. If they can't park their retail on-site, which appears to be the case, and there are going to be impacts associated with that in terms of finding additional spots, there may be costs associated with doing that, and the Pimenelu idea 
is to have the developer make a contribution to offset those those costs. But in terms of the how the, the, the numbers and how exactly that's going to be scheduled out, that's the part that's a work in progress. Now, it's then, much like many of our other merchants don't have on-site parking for their right. for the retail but portions of their business. They're part of the kind of like this parking district, which is kind of a mishmash where, and these guys are really their own, they're separate. They're outside the district. Even if they're part of the district, not members of the district. I remember that discussion. Like, well, the, the, the program uh, on this project is to park all of the residential on site um, and not to have it open to the public. It's not really a public parking lot where there's an easement and anybody can park in there. It's going to be reserved for residents only. Okay. Well, not all of it. There's going to well, be, there are gonna be four, four, four spots eight. set aside for, but I think for the service. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, for, I think there's commercial. There's room for commercial in there as well, isn't there? I think four spots, right? The retailers themselves, yeah. right? Yeah. But the, the proprietors, not the yeah. public. Okay. Eight spots in one service. Right. Okay, and then there's a reference here to waiver of site requirements. It's on page seven, and I'm just not smart enough. So I'm just going to ask you whatever it's referring to, which is the town board will waiver modify in whole or in part. The standards set forth in, well, I'm not going to attempt to read all those numbers together, but do you see what I'm talking about? Sure. What is that referring to? So 16 comes at the end of this long list of requirements, right? And if there was a particular requirement that created this kind of, that tripped this kind of hardship as described in 16, the town board would have the ability to modify or waive that requirement. It's kind of an escape hatch to, to make it work if nothing else works. Provided the standards met. Okay, that's the, those are the only questions I had on, on legislation. I think, you know, the, I'm, I'm going to say this again, the, I'm somebody who was against the form piece code. Um, and I think, you know, because uh, a group of people where the mentality is, there aren't that many lots in town worth developing because they're either the tenth of an acre and so forth and they're not going to have impact. And this is an impactful spot. It's been sitting there for a long time. I think there are only three or four of those throughout town. And I think that's, so I'm glad we're focusing on what we can do here. I get the idea of spot zoning and so forth. Uh, I feel like I've seen it happen during my entire time here where, you know, because a private property owner wants to do something, or the government wants to do something, and we have to react to it. Um, I'm happy to hear that we have town in control, and the government is not, well, other parts of the government aren't imposing the, the will upon us, and I hope we can find a, a solution that works for all the parts. I'm sorry, the other part is, is there a way to demonstrate in some sort of visually the part that needs to be cut off? I don't think we're there yet. Okay. We're not there yet, but I'm certainly going to advocate that once kind of the final proposal is reached, that it's it's going to be, uh, we'll do another like virtual walkthrough that's online. And then um, maybe certainly maybe. when site plan comes up, that, that that'll be. Maybe a, a different way of asking the question is, uh, I think it's a 470 foot um, is that the front piece? About that? 430, 470? That's right. 470. 470. So, 478. Where, where along that is, is that easement? How, how, how far deep can it It will become clear. We're waiting to get that from it, the, It's from on the, the very applicant. northern part, the very tip. It's like the angle. Okay. We're waiting to get the, the little triangle, triangle that ends the, the building. Okay. Um, All right. That's it. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> I apologize, um, everybody. I have to go. I have a car waiting for me to get me into the city. I have to be in at four in the morning tomorrow. So, uh, I apologize. Okay. Have a good night, Jeremy. Good, good night. night. Thank Bye. you. Bye, Jeremy. Does that have to get the makeup? Um. All right, Ed, Ed Frank. Like your makeup? Yeah. <laughs> good evening, uh, Ed Frank, New South Lane, Chappaqua. My primary concern is parking. For uh, compare this with uh, an affordable housing building uh, on Hunts Lane, the Conifer building. 
there are 28 apartments there, 100% affordable housing. Um, com previous comments about diversity. Well, we, we have a whole 28 in one building. Um, aside from that, there's, there's only one parking uh, spot for each apartment in this proposed building. That's similar to the Conifer building. Well, the Conifer building is all affordable housing. So they may not have money for more than one car. However, people living in what sounds like uh, an expensive building are bound to have more than one car. Keep in mind that for uh, several months during the winter, there is no parking allowed on the streets. Uh, the parking lot right across the street from uh, the proposed site is three hour limit. So I, I don't know where all the parking is going to be. And, and I think if somebody is proposing to construct something, I think the town code calls for them not to rely upon public parking, but to provide parking on their site. Brings back the form-based code, the foolish idea of having parking one mile away with transportation to and from the site and only up until midnight. Um, the other thing I would, and by the way, um, I'm in favor of something being done there. Uh, there's no question about that. It's just what is being done. Um, the other thing is the green roof, which I think is a good thing. But if anybody has taken a ride uh, on Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn, somewhere around Fourth Avenue and looked up at the Barclays uh, building, the, the Barclays Center, that's a green roof. And you will see that vast areas of that roof are brown. So if in fact this is going to be a green roof, something um, has to be in the agreement that it has to be well taken care of. And if it turns brown, then there has to be some either penalties or the town steps in and does the work and hands the bill, uh, the bill to the building owner. Um, that's, uh, and, and one more thing, the, the fact that um, it's being described as transit oriented, let's be real about that. Manhattan is transit oriented, areas of Brooklyn, the Bronx and Queens are transit oriented. You could get to anywhere uh, I, they, there are buses and train stations all over the place. Here, think about it. We have a neighbor, Armonk. To get to Armonk by public transportation in this quote unquote transit oriented location, you would have to take the Metro North Railroad to White Plains and then take a beeline bus from White Plains to Armonk. That is not transit oriented. Anyway, I, I do hope that something goes through on this site, but it needs to fit in with the town and, and has to meet all of our code requirements. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. I, I did write down your comments. Just as an aside, I think if you actually wanted to get to Armand from New York City, you would have to do the exact same thing by public transportation because they don't have a train station. So I think you'd have to take the same train to the same place and the same bus, just as an FYI. Yeah, oh, okay, but <laughs> the, 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 you're, you're talking about from the city to there. If, if you, do you know how many people uh, in the city, in New York, in Manhattan, don't even have a car? Uh, people in Brooklyn, where, where I grew up, I knew so many people who didn't have a car. So it's different. This is not transit oriented. Manhattan, Bronx, areas of Queens, um, Brooklyn, the, those, those are transit oriented. Uh, and, and this also reminds me of the governor's um, housing compact. The, because we have a train station, this is transit oriented. No, I don't think so. Anyway, thank you for listening as always and, and have a good night. Thanks so much. Thank you too. Um, all right, is there anyone <laughs> who would like to speak who has not yet spoken 
All right, then Cynthia, I'm gonna come back to you for a minute. Hi, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that. Um, I forgot to ask, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, I forgot to ask, um, Rob sort of alluded to it, that one whole building seems to be sort of falling off because of this um, easement. Do we know yet, do we know how many units would be left? I haven't had a chance to check because this we're was the first I heard of that. We're waiting to get that information. Uh -huh. Okay. We're waiting. And, Okay, and I expressed my concern previously about delivery vehicles and that sort of thing. Um, that was my really only reservation with this building. Is there some way to discuss with the um, architect, the developer and the owner, the idea of if they're not able to build that building on that little spit of land, is there any way to use some of that for a pull off for those delivery vehicles, which would ease congestion along North Greeley? Um, I actually think right there, they're not allowed to put per, uh, impervious surface there, but- It's already there. Permanent, but I do believe that the uh, architect answered that question in a memo that was a few weeks ago um, and kind of rejiggered some of the flows to accommodate um, vehicles. Jeff, do you want to talk to that for a second? I can. Sure. Oh. Yes, you have to get up. So, well, we can hear you with people. I'm okay, so, so, so in our last meeting, our architect showed how the delivery entrance into the building has clear height for delivery trucks, and we added a service delivery spot into the parking area for all, call it Amazon, Uber, Whatever you're shaking your head no to me. Oh, that's what you're doing. I don't know that it is. I understand that that's what your proposal is, but I think that we need to re-examine proper delivery drop, you know, uh, deliveries. And given the, the fact that you have an easement area, you can pave over the easement area. Um, that that may be a better location for a direct pull off that's not in a garage. For deliveries that's so, kind of so, what i was asking yeah yeah so, so you so, can put it just has to be something you're willing to rip up correct yeah, we correct and, and, and yeah, again just, without, but but you need time to reconfigure yeah. that space yeah. but but right you know you had submitted an option of putting it in the garage from an accessibility standpoint it may be better not to put it in the garage if you have an area outside i just think it We'll show everybody yeah. what we came up with. We okay. came up with a solution from the first public right. hearing to address it. But Cynthia, get it off the street and out of the way. That's one of the comments that we definitely, you know, wrote down and, and asked yeah. them to, to address. So it's still, yeah, we, we I appreciate you. that. I mean, I think my concern would be with the one space inside the parking garage, you know, if there are 40 or 30 or however many apartments end up being built, you know, at any given time, you could have certainly more than one delivery vehicle pulling in there. I mean, sometimes I have more than one in my driveway. You know, it, it certainly is foreseeable that there could be more a demand than one spot at a time. Um, and so that's why I would be concerned about that. The other thing is, as someone else, uh, I don't remember who it was, maybe Ed Frank or somebody just referred to Conifer. Um, I actually spend a decent amount of time in that parking garage myself, um, and it is really tight in there, and I don't drive a delivery vehicle, but if I did, I'd have a lot of trouble maneuvering in and out of that, in and out of that particular parking garage, and from what I can tell of the drawings of, of 50 North Greeley, it looks like it would be similarly tight. So, I mean, I would be very concerned with that as being the, the option. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. All right, is there anyone else who would like to speak? Chuck. I said, my first question. <laughs> um, I'm gonna deputize Cynthia because she's gonna be a great person when we come around to stop solving problems. My deputy architect, my junior designer, because she's thinking, she's thinking about stuff and she's, 
she's thinking in questions and she's 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 flexible and um and and i too went into that parking garage at conifer and um i couldn't get i couldn't turn around because there was a plumbing truck fixing something it was really congested but anyway that's not why i'm here i'm here to say i'm gonna uh, I'm going to make application for a special use permit to put a blue tent in our parking lot. And I'm going to stay there until they take me away in a box. I am not going to quit this. And how long is it going to go? As long as it has to go, we're going to be there every single time and maybe in many That's other places. Great. Now, <clears throat> you get that, right? I don't have a problem with that. Thank I, you. But I want to know what your comments are on this. Here they are. Um, I'm making believe that I'm on the Architectural Board of Review or the ARB or the BAR, whatever it is. <laughs> and um, I'm going to read the mission statement that I, I, when I was on the board, I had to read. Um, and the board uh, ensures that proposed work blends not only into the harmony of the structure, but also the neighborhood in which it is situated. Excessive uniformity, dissimilarity, inappropriateness, or poor quality design in the exterior appearance of the building or other structures erected or altered in any neighborhood adversely affects the desirability of the immediate area and neighborhood areas for residential business or road. That is their job. Mm -hmm. That's and, why we're involving them. Well, I have to tell you, I was at that meeting. And I heard opinion, but I didn't hear that that thing was inappropriate, too dissimilar, and, and it, it impacted the neighbor. I didn't hear that. I heard a lot of, hey, it's a nice building. Well, yeah, maybe it is a nice building, but is it in context? Does it fit? Their mission is not to tell me how pretty the walls are. Their mission is to say, it fits, and if it doesn't fit, I wish they would start talking like it doesn't fit. Thank you. Thank you. Just to play devil's advocate, I did see you nodding at that meeting when the architect said, we're a bunch of architects. None of us are ever going to agree on, you know, what a building should look like right. or the beauty of a building right. or if it fits. And I heard you, you went, yeah. Yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> so yeah. I just but, want to play devil's but it's advocate. Pretty, I, think it's any tough architect, it, I think any architect yeah. when asked, does it fit the neighborhood or is it in context with the neighborhood? Not what it looks like now, and then, but not why the corridor is where it is or in, but does it fit the neighborhood? Is it in context with the quiet, friendly, welcoming, I think, mission of our Hamlet? And so, uh, architect or not architect, is it similar or dissimilar? That's what the mission is. Thank you. All right, any other comments? In person. All right, how about online? Any other comments? No hands are raised. No hands are raised. Okay, well, going once. Going twice? All right, can I, um, I, I think we're gonna adjourn this again. Well, I, the board may wanna discuss what the next meeting looks like. And as we think about some of the questions that came out of last week's meeting, mm -hmm. talking about retail, how much of it, talking about the north end of the building, what, how that's gonna change, the entrance, the, the bike storage, and then sort of the, the real estate, valuable real estate mm -hmm. that that's taking up. Those, to me, are issues that would benefit from a discussion among the whole town board. And maybe withdrawing in some of the, but that's up to the board to decide. But to me, the efficiency that we were looking for with the first working group, which was really just tasked with um, blue penciling the legislation, these types of issues, I think, are broader yep. and would benefit from everyone's input. So I agree. Um, and I also think we're going to want to see kind of what revised plans look like a little bit so we can we can discuss those as well. Right. Some of those things we talked about, we don't even know if they were possible. So that's kind of where we left off is if if this is what is being suggested or recommended, is it even possible or are we just wasting our time? So I welcome the opportunity for the five of us to talk about it. And if you think other members of other boards, do you think we should just meet the five of us first? Well, I, I, I think that we, we saw real value last week. Yeah, we uh, did. With, I do. With, with, I agree. With bringing in the other boards. And remember, too, that with a special permit application, um, you have 
refers to the planning board and the ARB <coughs> automatically at the outset of the application. So what you're doing now with the legislation is going to track what would happen later if this legislation goes on the books and, and applications received. So I, whether that means bringing 15 people around the table or five plus two and two, you know, I defer yeah. to the board well, on to, that. To Jeremy's point before, and I agree with, and I think the reason we formed the working group was, yeah. was because we all agreed with this, to put three boards at a table 15 people, let's say, is really not going to be productive. Um, I think everyone's going to have an opinion, and while we want to hear everyone's opinion, I think if we're moving things along, it can be difficult. I'm wondering, um, and i throwing this out there, if it makes sense for the town board and then the working group members to be sitting at that table, um, so the two members of the planning board, the two members of the architecture review board, and the town board, to go through that with certainly everyone else is available for comment or input, but I, I think to sit around the table it might make more sense to tailor it, but I'm open to Yeah, I think, I think that's what I suggested in an email to you. I think that because we're the lead agency and we will be making the determination that I think the five of us should be present uh, because the working group has gone beyond the scope of discussing and tinkering with the legislation. So for that reason, I think we should all five of us be there with two members from the other other boards. And that doesn't preclude yeah, the other members from the boards from chiming in, right? That's what I wanted to make clear in my comments. At no point has anyone been precluded from sharing their questions, their concerns, mm -hmm. their comments. I've actually welcomed them. I've sought them out. I've reached out to members in the community who are here often, right? So no one has ever been precluded from raising their issues or concerns or talking about it. And I want to be clear, I'm on the working group. I've never let anyone feel that they weren't welcome to share their thoughts and opinions with me. I'm happy to take a phone call to answer questions, to talk something out. So and I'm the same way. Our yeah, so review probably, you know, board, mm -hmm. planning board. Yeah, yeah, I feel like beyond I beyond the Wait. scope, beyond the members of the working group. If Kanan, for example, or Bob, or anyone else in the area couldn't come to the meeting but had their own thoughts or comments that they wanted to share, share them. Share them yeah, with one of us, share them with all of us. Too. I welcome it. Community members, we receive Great. emails all the time in favor, against, questions, comments. That's what we're here doing. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah, so Ali, I just want to say I, I hope that my comments didn't make you feel like like you didn't welcome no, comments. No, but I just so want to clarify that I do welcome it. I, I definitely do. wasn't saying that. All I was, I was talking about the structure that we set up for the working group. Not the intent, not the approach, not, not you know, not your willingness. It was not that at all. It was simply the structure that we set up, that it would be two town board members and two and two around the table for Got discussion. It. I'm, I'm glad so that was Yeah, because it did sound like you I, thought you couldn't give input, yes. so I'm glad no, you now no, no. think that you but, but it is true that we could not be at the meeting in the same way that the two members, the two designated members were, otherwise it would have been a town board meeting. Well, was that was the meeting. point. That was the point of no, having wasn't. the working group so that we didn't have all members of our board. You know, the point that it was so that we could collaborate yeah. better with yeah. a smaller group of people. Maybe. But it never, and it was a public yeah. notice meeting. It was never, there was a town board meeting. It was so that, and the way working groups work is you have people from different groups with different um, skill I sets. I don't want to waste too much time. Yeah. Yeah. So but I'm that's looking what forward to the five Jeff, of us. come on up. Come I'm on up. I'm looking forward to the five of us. Comment. I just wanted to say, I've been, this is over a year I'm in this room. Yes. For one year, I've sat here and got no comments. It's too big, it's this, it's ugly, it's whatever. The reason that meeting last Thursday went the way it did is because the planning board wrote a memo that tore our project apart. Mm -hmm. And if I would have sat there and allowed it to continue, it, this project would not go on. So we rolled our sleeves up and we took the plans out and I thank the Architects Review Board for being there. Hopefully got that right. Yes. We don't even know. <laughs> I'm going with it. We don't even know. 
we sat there and rolled our sleeves up and went point by point of their memo to go through what their point of it was. Because if you took what they wrote and took every item, it would have taken the project from this to this to this and not been feasible. But if you sat there and discussed that, what do you really want to see done? Well, we got comments about what the street would be. We got comments about the retail. We got comments about the parking. We got specific viewpoints, not just a memo that was just shot across the bow that we never had a chance to ever respond to. So for once, we all sat there collectively and said, okay, let's change the street wall. Let's change the parks that are on the ground. Apparently, not everybody loves the parks. Okay, so we'll address it and work towards it. And we've been doing that for the last four days and coming up with alternatives to what we've been presenting for a year. For one year, all we've got is it's too tall and too many points of a working group. So for the first work. time in one year, we've actually gotten productive and sitting there with a set of plans and going through and my point why exactly things are done. That you know, you were given some direction and you were doing some different things. We were so talking that was my for the point. first time instead of everybody but just nothing was decided. Ass. That was the one we decided. We're we, seeing what yeah. we can do. But you have a you had a direction. I have a lot of di different direction. A lot of direction. We started exactly. with retail at over 6,000 square feet. I mean, and honestly, the town board at that meeting. meeting played a much less important role, to be honest, than the architectural yes. review board and the planning board because they were specific questions and specific design issues that we wanted to hear from the experts on. Right. And we did, and that's what made it so helpful. The town board, I mean, I feel like we played a good role, but <laughs> frankly, we didn't make any decisions. That's for this whole town board to decide, but with the input, and it was working from um, our right. planning board and working the Working with all the There's a lot of things in the design of this project that we talk about quickly and nobody actually listens to what we're saying of why things are the way they are. Why there's a buffer to the train tracks. Right. Why all of the units actually face courtyards because that's the only light and air you have. You can't have units facing the train track because you can't open windows. Unfortunately, the project, I think it's Hunt's Place, mm -hmm. the windows don't open that face the train track. That's sad, that's not good housing. That's terrible. We don't want to build that. So we're not going to design that. So when you hear comments that come from us, we don't want to build something different. We don't want to build a project where we're going to bad, build bad housing that's not leasable, that's not desirable. And if a project gets turned into something that we don't think is feasible, that's unfortunately we're not going to build something that's just bad. I just want to say, you know, what I personally got out of the meeting was that this has to be not just collaborative in terms of planning board, ARB, and town board, but also with the community, which we're hearing a lot about. And, you know, I think for me, one, the comments that I took issue with are, is that one person was kind of, this is the building that I want to build. There are people in this community that have lived here 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. So those opinions matter too. And it has to be, we have to take into account that we need housing, we want housing, we want diverse housing, but we also need to take into account the needs, the wants, the desires of our, our community members too, and that's important. So I think for me, the most valuable thing to come out of the meeting was a willingness by everyone to realize that there's going to be some give and take. Not everyone's getting everything that they want, and we're going to try to come together to give the community something that they want, right? That's the point of this. So this isn't the end. For me, this is kind of the beginning. It's a step forward. I'm hoping that we can continue to have these meetings, continue to have these conversations with all of us, take the public comment, take the feedback, and, and just put everything together to, to come up with the best possible outcome for the community. That's why we've been here for a year doing it. All right. And we think some of the ideas we've come up with, you see them very quickly in a presentation. When you actually look at the plans, and we can annotate them a little further, some of the things we've done on the plan, we say wider sidewalks, those are actually public spaces with landscaping and furniture that are supposed to be for the community. They're not supposed to be for the residents on the ground floor. They're supposed to be community spaces. I think there's four designated park areas at the ground floor at this point. Um, or there will be in the next iteration. Um, I think there's three and a half at the current moment. But the, the point is we've looked at it and we continue to look at it of how we can make it better and listening to what we heard last week, we continue to 
improve on it, the unit counts, et cetera. So we're trying to do it with the limitations of the site and hopefully <laughs> we can get somewhere in the near future. And if we can't, we've all tried hard, um, but hopefully we'll get there. Thank, right. you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So I think we should adjourn the public hearing but maybe not set the next date until we've had a chance to meet and see the revised. Well, we have to set a date. Now, we can always get to that date and decide to postpone it again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but we need to set a date tonight. And the board because may I think we would talk okay. like at the next working session. We would kind of hash this out as a board and, you know, invite members of the ARB and the planning board. Right, but one thing the board could do is have that discussion, say, set aside an hour on an agenda and then take mm -hmm. public comments for another <coughs> hour and do it on the same night. Or mm -hmm. you could go back to what we did last week, which is um, have a dedicated, like, say, on a Thursday night meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, for me, I feel like I'm hearing the same things now from the public over and over again. So I think it would be, and while those are valuable comments, um, we're looking at those. So I think that it would be helpful to kind of have us discuss it and then allow the, the public to comment on the new iteration of, of the proposal of the legislation rather than keep talking about the same thing. That's sort of my thought. Uh, yeah, I feel like I'm at, at the point that I need some more new information right. to continue. Sorry, the discussion. It's okay. Right. This is weird. I agree. <laughs> um, but I mean, I don't feel like that's going to be next week. No. So how do you? I mean, maybe I will have it to you guys. What's today? Tuesday by Thursday. I'll have to do by tomorrow. How about that? Okay. Wow. Um, I mean, as long as we have something so new what to do you, look at. what do you think? When I say this, it'll think. be uh, a plan. It's not going to be like animations and all of right, that. Right, right, right. It's just the, the first floor. Something we can discuss, and I want to make sure you know you're there, and the and Stanley and the, and you, Tom, and the planning board. But not a public hearing. What? June twenty seventh. Is open. Uh, so we have our uh, visioning consultant yeah. scheduled in the, from 5 30, 6 30. So it, it could start at 7 30. What's going to start at 7 30? Whatever meeting. So this would be a working, a working session. A work session. Would it be a work group meeting or however you want to phrase that group mm -hmm. so that you can review the submission that they're going to make? I think it sounds to me like a, a town board work session inviting two members of the planning board, two members of the ARB, yeah, and the, the developer, the owner, whoever wants to come we, on that we, side. I agree, we'll but certainly if we're going to have this by let's, this week, I'm not going to say it has to be tomorrow, but this week, I don't see why we as a town board can't look at that next week also. But you can't, be, next week you will be, next week you will be in conflict with the planning board meeting. No, no, for us as a town board to discuss it. And then the following meeting on the 27th that you're talking about, we would, then the planning board will have had time to look at it, the ARB will have time to look at it, and we can then on the 27th come together as a town board and, you know, Bob and Stanley and um, Eldad and Tom and whoever else wants to come on the 27th, but certainly by next week, we can be discussing it. So that would be the 21st, that would be the Wednesday. Yeah, and I think it makes sense to, to allow the other boards time to look at it. We, I don't think mm -hmm. we should assume that they'll have a few days and that would be good enough. So. Okay. It's fine, I just wanted to, wasn't, wasn't Jeremy expected to be out of town? Right, he's not a oh, next week. right. But he'll have an opportunity in the right. second meeting, right? We have yeah. the we'll materials. Have meeting next week. <laughs> We're going to have a work us, session yeah. next week. By all of us. You, you can come. I mean, next week is the last week every kid is home before camp. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I won't be there, I promise. He doesn't have to. I will have no, a nine-year-old friend come to me, and that's not We can have us discuss it. Yeah, we can talk about it. It's fine. We have the larger group the following week. That's what I think. Yeah, that makes sense to me. It's online. Together. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe maybe Andrew can come or 
Okay. Well, you know, I think Jeremy will right, get, we'll, we'll he'll get, get the material. Time to yeah. Yeah. discuss it. It's not going to be the only yeah. time we talk know. about it. Absolutely. Yes. I think we should okay. meet yeah, next great. week and then have our larger group meeting the following the so everyone will have an opportunity to be on the same page. Okay. So is the public hearing being adjourned? So, um, so we're going to adjourn the public hearing until the 27th. So the public hearing will be held so on the 27th. So we're going to stack, we'll stack uh, a working group meeting and then the public hearing. Correct. Okay. So both of those need to be noticed. Yes. Okay. And can I just get a clarification from the board that our August meeting is going to be moved from the 15th to the 8th? Yes. Yes. Okay. Everyone just do it. I pulled everyone. Okay. Yes. Right. So just so everybody's on the same page with scheduling. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. I'm, I'm wondering if we want to reconsider having the public hearing on the 27th, because if we're going to have a big discussion right before that, that won't give people time to review and then come back with comments. Um, well, it'll give them time to review the documents because we're going to talk about that on the 21st also. Right, but the, if we're all getting together and we're opening it, the hearing again, it just seems like... We can always have another one. I guess that's we're all in favor of that. Okay. Okay. That's fine with me. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. More, more than less. Okay. So, Good. Uh, so we'll calendar um, the working group meeting um, for the 27th. It'll also be noticed the motion that you need to make is to adjourn tonight's okay. public hearing to June 27th. Okay. So, 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 so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, and can I have so okay? We just did that. All right, so that's good. So now we're just going to move to resolutions. Yeah, and can I just say something though? Ed, I don't think it's a working group meeting, I think it's a town board meeting. No, with the other, with the other. Thank you, everybody. It'll be. It'll be noticed. It's going to be fun. Well, it's got to be noticed anyway, but it's going to be town board and two members of the working group. Right, when, when we make the, put the agenda the together, we'll indicate. Anyway. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. But it's going to be noticed as any other town board meeting. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, can we no. just, can start just with summarize the this meeting? Because again, I'm very confused. So on the 21st, is the 21st, 21st. the town board is going to meet. Before, in a regular work session. In a regular session. work session to discuss any new changes that we get from the developer. And then on the 27th, we're going to have a larger working group with the Architectural Review Board and the Planning Board. Followed by a public hearing. When you, said, when you said a work session, do you mean the working group work session? Yes. You don't mean On the, the 27th. And the full town board. Yes. Right, but that's not the town. It's a different group. I, you said a work session. I thought you meant the town, just the town board. Okay. No. That's on the 21st. That's on the 21st. On the, 21st. On the 27th. The working group is the 27 and the rest of the town. I would say that digesting the information and getting it out to the public in that time frame is really impossible because well, we're going to have another. We're public not ending. Meeting. That's the not the end of the public hearing. Because you know, it, it just it just doesn't work that way. I mean, we're a grassroots group, and it's very difficult to take well, the information. Do what you can do, and we're going to. It's not going to be the only public hearing. Okay. Thank you. Um. All right. So Holly, can I kick us off. Tonight? Thanks, I, I move to adopt the items 1 through 15 as listed on the consent agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I move to approve the payment of claims in the amount of to, I move to approve the payment of, retroactively approve the payment of claims yeah. the amount of $882,126.12 listed on the summary AP check register and detail voucher detail reports all dated June 9th, 2023. Checks were printed and distributed to each claimant listed on Friday, June 9th, 2023. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to authorize the hiring of the following individuals listed below to the position of recreation attendant to serve as 2023 camp staff at the corresponding rates as indicated below. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I move to authorize the award of bids to the lowest responsible bidders under the DPW 2023-07 purchase and installation of highway maintenance materials bid with items 18 through 24 are to be awarded as a combined award based on the lowest total sum of items 18 to 24 as shown per the attached spreadsheet. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
I move to award bids to the lowest responsible bidders under the DPW 2023-07 water maintenance materials bid. This is a service and material requirements bid for fixed itemized prices for a one year period as per the attached spreadsheet. Thank you. All in favor. Aye. Aye. And I have one more. Yes. Pursuant to town code section 90-10, I move to designate the building inspector and assistant building inspector as town officials who are authorized to enforce the provisions of chapter 90 regarding noise violations. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. And, and I have a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn the meeting. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Aye.